Um, hello and welcome everyone to Geoscience Australia's Green Steel Workshop. Um, my name is Christina Anastasi and I am the branch head um, at Geoscience Australia and I also have the pleasure of hosting this workshop today. Um, I would like to begin today by first, firstly acknowledging the Wadjuk people, the traditional custodians on of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that are here today. Um, I'm very excited to see you all in person actually. It's um, quite unique. It feels like um, a long time between drinks and seeing people face to face. But I also want to do a big shout out to all our people who are online today as well as part of this workshop. Um, we have a broad range of organisations that are represented here today. We've got representatives from the renewable sector, mining and steel sectors, NGOs, government and researchers. And I'm sure that we will all leave today with new insights and glimpses of a future decarbonised Australia. Now, almost every week we hear of a new climate record being broken somewhere in the world, which is adding an urgency to the need to decarbonise Australia's and the world's economy. The Australian government has recognised this need and has committed to Australia achieving net zero emissions by 2050. Furthermore, only a few months ago, Australia's commitment to achieving this goal and becoming a global leader in the renewable energy rollout and critical mineral supply was unveiled in a climate pact between our Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and the United States President Joe Biden. This pact boosts cooperation between our two nations. The iron ore and steel sector are particularly, particularly important for Australia today and into the future. We are the world's largest iron ore exporter, worth Australia's worth Australian 133 billion in 21-22. And we are also profiting from the current way from the current way steel is being made by exporting $72 billion worth of metallurgical coal. But the steel sector is a major contributor to the world's greenhouse gas emissions. It represents some, somewhere around 7%. The reason we are here today is to dis, is to start discussing how to decarbonize this important industry. I hope that today we will start identifying and considering questions such as what are the key challenges that are impacting a decarbonisation pathway and where can Geoscience Australia help to help to address or alleviate particular issues. Our aim is to help Australia maintain its competitive advantage and provide a framework to attract support investment towards a new expanded onshore value added processing along the green steel iron development cycle. Australia is blessed with excellent solar and wind resources and has extensive iron ore resources, both hematite and magnetite. The combination of cheap power from solar and wind and iron ore could make Australia made iron and steel more competitive globally. Work undertaken by Geoscience Australia and others suggests by co-locating co plants in sun-rich, iron-rich places like Western Australia's Pilbara and South Australia's Air Peninsula could help overcome the first mover problem for green hydrogen. Well, as you know, you cannot have a hydrogen industry with buyers for it and you cannot have buyers without hydrogen. First, it avoids the problem of transporting hydrogen, which especially in liquid form can be expensive and energy intensive to transport. And second, co-locating green hydrogen gives an immediate boost to the industry. At present, green hydrogen is at the early stage before the increased scale and knowledge drives the cost down. So combining hydrogen with steel appears to be a perfect match. Not only are we decarbonising our own industry, we would also have a global impact by helping to drive down emissions from our trading partners. Today, we will be sharing green, with you all green steel research that we have been undertaking with our colleagues 
from Monash University. This has been completed under our successful Exploring for the Future program, a $225 million program, which is advancing Australia's understanding of its natural resources. That is our groundwater, mineral and energy resources. We will also be getting the latest updates from industry, government and researchers. But most importantly, we want to hear from you. This workshop is all about hearing from you at how we at Geoscience Australia can help Australia reach net zero. I invite you to participate and contribute at every opportunity. We genuinely do want to hear from you today. You know, what is the type of data you need? What tools would be helpful? You know, today is your opportunity to help us and Geoscience Australia's Future Work Program. Thank you. I'd like to welcome our first uh, speaker for the morning session, uh, Zihan Wang. Uh, Zihan is a senior research fellow currently embedded within Geoscience Australia's mineral resources advice team. His research centers around sustainability and industrial ecology perspectives for the mineral and energy resource sectors with a focus on mine tailings, critical minerals, hydrogen, and green commodities. Well, thank you, Marcus, and greeting to all the guests in the room and online. I'm Johan, and today will be my honor to present the Green Steel Opportunity and Challenges for Australia. This is a brief outline from my presentation today. I will start with an overview of the Australian's iron ore industry, following by the overview of the global steel industry, which leads to the discussion around why decarbonization for the heavy industry sector is of critical importance, and discuss around some technology abandonment technology to reduce the overall carbon footprint, which creates some evolving change in the global steel market in the foreseeable future, and policy alignment towards green steel, which then lead to Australia to conclude some rational conclusion that green steel could be our opportunity, although it comes with a sort of challenge. And most important, I will conclude my presentation on why geoscience is an important factor to helping us address some of the questions and give you a bit of hint for what we have prepared for you guys today. First thing, an overview of the Australia's iron ore industry. As you can see, Australia is the world leader both in the iron ore resource and iron ore production. Uh, given by the map on the right hand side, Australia's iron ore export is larger than the, the other top four countries combined. Uh, the revenue of iron ore export has generated over about 133 billion Australian dollars as the leading mineral export for Australia economic. In other words, we are the world leader. Unfortunately, when it comes to steel industry, things is completely different. At the moment, Australia already have about 5.8 million tons of steel production capacity domestically, and steel as a really critical component for clean energy transaction in the world, as projected by IEA. Its demand will increase from 1.9 billion tons and now, yep, to a, about increase a third at least. So the logical conclusion is by capitalizing on a green steel opportunity, it represents a great significant opportunity for Australia to add value to our world leading iron ore sector. So, as you can see, the decarbonization for heavy industry sector is almost the hot topic all around the world at the moment. Well, this plan, I hope of this graph can explain a bit why. Uh, please, according to the Bloomberg, this graph shows the scope one direct emission from several industry sectors. As you can see, the steel sector is leading the emission by about 2.8 billion tons carbon dioxide emission, equivalent emission, following closely by cement, petroleum-based chemistry, and aluminium. As a result, those are the four key things for most the strategy and climate change mitigation methods developed by almost developed countries. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, as a result, in order to achieve our climate change mitigation goal, the emission abatement technology has become one of the key sectors most country and research focus on at the moment. As a project by Bloomberg again, in order to achieve the sustainable economic net zero scenario by 2050, all the abatement technology has role to play, but most stand out is hydrogen. 
Uh, we have some excellent speech from prepared by my colleague Andrew Fox and Peter Gumnick from CSL, focus on the potential of hydrogen implementation for green steel sector. And Australia will have a great potential in hydrogen as well. Good example will be the hydrogen-based reduct direct reduction iron, which implements the renewable energy source by solar and wind farms into the water-based electrolysis, produce green hydrogen, then apply with some high quality iron ore, or high quality iron plate into the direct reduction furnace, produce the product as we call sponge iron or direct reduction iron. Then we can use electron on the furnaces again, implementing the renewable electricity from wind and solar farms to generate low carbon footprint steel. But again, this is only one technology rule and which has been proven feasible by the first pilot plan by SSAB's hybrid circle in Sweden in 2021. Okay, in that case, what's the change of bringing Bidos technology into the global steel market and our policy? Let's first go through the blue steel market, uh, global steel market first. As we can see at the moment, we Australian iron ore exports dominantly rely on direct shipping ore. No, also knows high quality hematite ore, which is supposed the blast furnace, as shown in the BOF scenario. In order to achieve net zero, there are two trends that are quite significant. One is increasing ratio of the scrap metal as the, the more and more recycling will happen in the sector. The second will be used of direct reduction reduction on furnace, hopefully dominantly by hydrogen based direct DI production. <laughs> Excuse me. So there's a significant increase in the demand chains from the good quality hematite ore, as we know now, into the high quality direct reduction grade of the magnetite resource, which is suitable for DI process. Okay, so in order to make that happen, as we can see in the global level, there are a lot of policy and new uh, policy strategy has been implemented. The good example is the uh, United States the Inflation Reduction Act, which is actually about 370 billion US dollar worth total investment directly into the clean hydrogen production and advanced in industry fertilized facility development plan, which is support low carbon steel, aluminium, cement, glass paper, and chemical sector. Similarly, in next month, the European will introduce their first carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is carbon drive for focusing on following products, cement, iron ore, steel, aluminum, fertilizer, electricity, and hydrogen. China has pushed aggressively on based on their new carbon policy, especially focused on domestic capability for electron armed furnaces, and we start to achieve their climate change target goal by 2060. And almost all the major steel maker has published their strategy towards cleaner steel, such as European-based Nippon Steel, Costco, and Tata Steel, which opens a new discussion around new business model. What can we capitalize our expertise on currently the hematite production into the magnetite production in the longer terms? And again, there will be new emerging technology coming up and hopefully, hopefully we can find something to introduce our strong hematite resource into clean iron production as well. And also there will be some excellent discussion from today's speakers like Chris, focus on Australian's push and policy support for the hydrogen opportunity. Well, there are here some preliminary results. As we can see, the one of the strong super Australia, we have a great iron ore resource. Turns out it has great synergy between the perspective area of a renewable energy system. As a highlight by the color patterns here, it's about top of 5% of the most perspective area for iron, for wind, solo, on the hybrid system, which is located very well in the Piribar region, also the Air Peninsula. And the other factors you need to consider is the level of the regional development like road transport work, network, power grid, and also water demand <coughs> for potential art, uh, hydrogen storage. And it turns out the salt lake and accumulation is a pretty cheap solution compared to building the hydrogen tanks over on the ground. Again, my, please stay tuned for my colleague Andrew Feist's presentation on this particular area. However, Rome isn't building on day. There are challenges that come to visit, especially what kind of iron quality and Technology is suitable for iron ore production. How what the potential production cost for our renewable energy system can be? What are the storage and development costs for new industries such as hydrogen in Australia? And is the customer willing to pay the high premium at the early stage of this kind of shift industry? And regional development always been a bottleneck, and also can, uh, environmental, social, government policy footprint, greenhouse gas footprint. They are all key factors we have to face 
now. And as because Christine are common, we also want to hear directly from you guys. What are the bottlenecks, hurdles you foresee for your, for actually utilize on the green state opportunity in Australia? We want to hear that and see what can help. And in that order, Australia, Geoscience Australia and working in collaboration with Monash University, we have established our economy very to set to provide some technical, technical economic modeling on a high level based on regional production capacity and also <clears throat> rapidly reflecting and changing cost and price estimation, uncertainty, risk assessment, infrastructure planning, etc. And the impact of our research has been exemplified by winning the Eureka Award Prize 2003 for innovation and sustainability. So, geoscience, we turns out we want to actually facilitate and support the green transition, low carbon economy in Australia by providing better knowledge on Australia's mineral resource. And we alignment those mineral resource to the perspective area and production, uh, high level production costs by renewable energy system, high stream production energy system. And we provide some high level estimation about all two product pathways, whether it's green iron, green steel, or green aluminum, green fertilizer. And then we can combine those comprehensively assess domestic export uh, value chain assessment issue to provide different scenario. Okay, today we have a really excellent work for sure prepared for you. In the morning, we, put our, we have a three excellent technical talk focused on the hydrogen opportunity for Australia. And after morning tea, we will have a hands-on section and more premiere for our green steel economic fairway model, beta version and provide some hands-on experience for our participants. And in the afternoon, we have have two excellent presentations from industry perspective about how decarbonization will influence the mining and the industry, and follow up by detailed group discussion to, de for, to collect direct feedback from you guys. What are the key concerns, key questions you think we could help you to answer in more way? How to make pre-competitive geoscience data can help you with? And to wrap up. Thank you for coming here. We have an uh, excellent workshop working for you. Looking forward to your feedback. I'm excited to be able to introduce our, our next speaker, Dr. Andrew Feitz. He's the Director of Low Carbon Geoscience and Advice at Geoscience Australia. Andrew is an environmental engineer and has over 10 years research experience in the geological storage of CO2. He leads uh, Geoscience Australia's research programs and technical advice on hydrogen and the geological storage of CO2. Right. Thank you, Andrew. All right, well, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here and to see so many uh, new faces in the audience. I often go to conferences and there's lots of familiar faces, but there's lots of new people here and um, this is uh, really great. Uh, look, I'm gonna be talking about the geoscience of hydrogen. It sounds strange. How is geoscience really helping this very technical sort of um, industry, but look, I'm going to guide you through some of the work that we've been doing and how we see geoscience playing a really important role in supporting the hydrogen industry. So this, we're the National Geoscience Agency. So we produce lots of national scale maps, right? This is where, that, that's our main focus. But it's, I think, a really good way to illustrate the type of work that we do and how it can inform um, the hydrogen industry. So for example, we've got the economic fairways tool and you're going to hear a lot more about that later in the day in the green steel tool. Um, so that's sort of mapping the prospectivity of, of where hydrogen, the best places are for hydrogen production around Australia. Red is good, blue is bad. Uh, critical minerals, we do work on mapping and understanding our natural critical minerals resources. So critical minerals are really important for, uh, for electrolyzers, for hydrogen turbines, for fuel, hydrogen fuel cells. They're all gonna need these quite, um, uh, these sort of, uh, these metals that are in, in short supply, these critical minerals. So we're doing work in that. And part of that other work is also looking at mapping the most prospective areas where we might find new critical minerals. We're probably gonna need, we're going to need more mines to produce these type of things. So where are new places in Australia that could be suitable to support, to find these uh, new industries? I'm not gonna talk about that in my talk, but that's, that's something that if you wanna find more about that, speak to Alison over there. She's the expert in that. Uh, natural hydrogen. I'm not sure how many of you in the audience have heard of natural hydrogen, a handful of people. It's really weird. It is a thing. 
Um, so there are places in the world where there is natural hydrogen, but we don't really understand its re true resource potential. So where and whether it can be commercially extracted um, in commercial quantities. So that's another area of, of work that we're doing. I'm not going to talk about more about that, but if you want to talk more, find a bit more about that, have a chat to uh, Didri over there. She can help you out. <laughs> um, but what I will be talking a little bit about today in my talk is uh, salt. So this is underground salt deposits that could be used to make caverns to store hydrogen in. So if you want to store large amounts of hydrogen, underground storage is the best way. Well, if you want to store large amounts of gas, underground storage is the way that is done. So for instance, our natural gas storage, the large amounts we have, I think about uh, seven underground natural gas storage facilities around the country, they, they buffer our, our, hydrogen, our natural gas supply. So we're going to need to store also large amounts of hydrogen underground. And so we're doing work in that, trying to map out where there could be good um, salt deposits. Here's our economic hydrogen fairway tool. I'm, not going to, I'm just going to touch on it. It was launched in 2021. It's very novel. It's a geospatial economic modeling that um, really maps out and takes into consideration not just layering different layers, but actually joining them all up together with, with costs. I think everyone can appreciate the cost is kind of the, the, the thing that it all comes down to. So in that tool, you can play with, you know, what's the operating cost, the, what's the cost of your water, where, where are you located, what's the capital cost. You can customise all that to come up with your own assessment of where potentially are good places to store hydrogen. Oh, sorry, to um, produce hydrogen. And here's an example here for wind and solar. In this example, you can choose you know, how much hydrogen you want to produce per year, find your target price, you, des you decide what it is, and then it'll run the calculations for you and tell you where is the most profitable places in Australia for the assumptions you've chosen to run for um, hydrogen production. And so that's, um, so I do really encourage you to play with that. We can play with that a little bit more this afternoon, but that's, um, that's our hydrogen economic fairways tool. I mentioned before that hydrogen storage is going to be a really key component about making how we make this industry, how we grow this industry. We're going to need to store hydrogen. And so it turns out that the most economic way to do that is through underground storage. And in particular, salt caverns have been identified as a key component for storing hydrogen underground in a cost-effective way. How does it work? Well, here's a sort of some cartoons here. On the left, we have salt storage. So basically you find a big salt dome underground somewhere. These salt domes can be quite deep. They could be a kilometer underground. So you've got to actually try and find these things. Um, you would drill a well into the salt and then circulate water through that. And you basically dissolve the salt to create a cavern. And over a number of years, sort of one to three years, through that brining operation, you can produce a cavern. And so these salt caverns are not new. They are used all around the world at the moment, mainly for storing uh, natural gas and for hydrogen in different, parts of the, in different parts of the world. But there are a couple of that are currently used for storing hydrogen underground as well. In this cartoon, is, and it's really kind of important, you've got the layer of salt and then you've got the dome or the salt dive here. So keep that in your mind too, because that's an important distinction that we'll have to talk about a little bit later. Um, the other alternative is if we do what is done in the natural gas industry, and that's where you inject hydrogen into a porous rock like a sandstone, and you can basically push the, the gas into the sandstone, and then you can take it back out again. So the thing about that process is it's a lot slower than if you have a cavern. And also we don't really understand what the losses could be under that process because hydrogen is quite different to natural gas. And so it's whether or not the recoveries are as good. But anyway, that's, that's something that we're also having a look at. Um, here's, a, here's a summary of the um, facilities that are currently operational around the world that are used for storing hydrogen underground. There's one in the UK and three in the US. 
And you can see that they're storing in the order of around about 5,000 tons. And the new ones which have been designed around the world are also looking at that sort of range, storing about 5,000 tons of hydrogen. The nice thing here, and courtesy of Linda, they provided me this photo, which I'm able to share with you today. Um, it's a photo of the Moss Bluff Salt Cavern Storage Facility in the US. So this facility, you can see the footprint is really small. You're storing a lot of hydrogen. You don't need thousands of tanks, hundreds or thousands of tanks. You know, this is the size of the facility to store something that store in the order of about, you know, several thousand tons of hydrogen. So at this facility, they produce hydrogen from, um, in this case, it's produced from uh, natural gas without any abatement because it's being used for fertilizer production. And so this is the thing that we're trying to do, right, is decarbonize that. But they get the hydrogen from a pipeline, put it underground. When they need more hydrogen to uh, supply to, an, to another manufacturing facility, say an ammonia plant or something like that, they'll withdraw that hydrogen. The hydrogen will need to go through a drying process, which is there, you can see that there. So it's not a very extensive process. And then it goes straight back into a hydrogen pipeline and off to the, off to the facility. And at this particular location, the hydrogen pipeline is in the order of about 500 kilometers of networked hydrogen pipeline. So these things exist is I guess the thing that I wanted to share with you today. And more of these things are being also planned around the world. Now that there is a demand for green hydrogen, which wasn't there previously, we're now starting to uh, see the need for, high, for hydrogen storage. And so people are really targeting these salt caverns and so, these salt structures to build these um, hydrogen caverns. Again, you're talking about 5,000 tonnes per cavern. All right, well, that's internationally, but what about in Australia? Well, over the last year or two, we've been mapping the salt resources and taking nice, pretty photos of the salt um, around the country, examples. Um, and you can see here, probably the, 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 the nicest one we've found so far, I guess, is the Boree salt in, from Queensland. You can see the sample there, and that's almost, I think, 96% pure halite. So halite is rock salt or the salt that you put on your fish and chips. So that's an entire, it's a half a kilometre thick of that type of salt. So it's really quite incredible that these structures exist. Um, it's located about 1800 metres underground, so it's quite deep. Um, but we, but there's certainly more salt like that around Australia. In offshore Polder Basin, again, um, we don't have, there's um, a very thick salt down there. It's about a kilometre thick. Um, in central Australia, there's really nice examples too in the Amadeus Basin. Um, you can see that's the one, the bottom left on your, yep, on your, on your screen. Also quite pure salt there. In the Canning Basin in Western Australia, here in Western Australia, we have these thick bedded salts. Remember before I talked about the bedded salt rather than the, the diapirs? So the bedded salts in Western Australia generally uh, are not highly purified salts. So they're a mixture of um, mudstones and salt. Um, we have a salt expert in the room. So Peter Haynes, he's gonna keep me on my toes. But anyway, um, if you wanna find out more, speak to Peter. But I guess the thing in Western Australia is what we're looking for is those domes. So those domes is where the salt has been squished out of those beds, out of the mud and more basically purified. So we need to find those domes in Western Australia. Um, and that's part of the work that we're doing uh, in uh, Geoscience Australia with our Western Australian colleagues. Um, here's an example of that um, salt. So this is a salt from the Mullawa Formation in the Wallara Subbasin. And you can see it's a mixture of different types of, of salt with that sort of um, other, you know, other rock basically. And um, that is not going to be suitable for constructing a cavern in. Whereas the Frome Rocks sample I've got here, it's a, just a small sample, but that salt there is quite pure. That's also in Western Australia. That's a, one of these dome type structures. So we need to find more of those dome structures. And there's ways that we can do that. 
One of the ways that we can do that is using airborne electromagnetics. So this is where we fly a plane or a helicopter with all these sort of sensors underneath it across the land. And it's able to measure the, um, the, uh, the conductivity down to about 500 meters. So for many cases, that's too shallow to spot salt. Um, but in some cases, what we do see is the salt structure might be buried, but it would have, you know, these things push up through the, through the, you know, through the ground basically very slowly over millions of years, but they bust up the rocks above it. And so we can see sometimes those signals of the busted up rocks above these buried salt structures. And you can see here foam rocks, for example, uh, what's that? That's number five. You see this sort of break in the in the red line. And then we've sort of marked out other ones that could be potentially structures under there. So that's one way potentially if we did a more dense survey that you could find more of these structures. Another area which is quite interesting is the offshore polder basin. So I mentioned before that this is about a kilometre thick of offshore salt. Um, that's located about 60, 70 kilometres offshore, those wells. And what we don't know is whether those well, if the salt's there, extends closer to onshore, because we don't have wells, basically. Um, so one way we could do that without drilling a really expensive well is to use gravity gradiometry to give us insight. So that's, again, flying more planes with fancy sensors on them. Um, and we've done a study to basically simulate the salt and the response of the gravity. And basically what it all boils down to is sure enough, if there is salt onshore, thick salt onshore, we would be able to detect it using gravity gradiometry. So that's a really powerful um, technique to potentially um, find new salt. And that could be applied for other parts of the country as well. I mentioned before about storing gas in deplete, uh, storing hydrogen in porous rocks like depleted gas fields. So I've got an example here of the Iona natural gas storage facility in Australia. So the red zone is where our sandstone is, and that's where you inject the natural gas. So gas is taken out of the Bass Strait, and oh, sorry, out of the yeah Bass Strait, uh, the Gippsland region. Um, it's then injected into that sandstone to provide seasonal storage back to, uh, to support Melbourne. So during, so it's basically taken out during summer, supplies more gas during the winter. And the gas is pushed into the sandstone. So it goes into those tiny spaces between the little grains in the sandstone. And what keeps it trapped there is a mudstone. So that's a different type of rock on top. And that is porous or connected. So the gas will go through the sandstone, then it hits that mudstone and it stays trapped there in those structures. That's how it works with natural gas. Now, what we were interested in is how would that work with hydrogen? Um, and we did a commissioned a study with using data from the CO2 CRC Otway facility, which is located about 20 kilometers west of that Iono plant. And I guess the the key message, it's quite, they're very complicated plots, but the key thing I want to show is that one, the top one is what happens when we fill our natural gas, our sandstone with, with hydrogen. So red is hydrogen, green is the cushion gas. So this is a sort of another gas that helps direct and keep the hydrogen near the well. And then blue is the uh, methane that's already present in the natural, in the depleted gas field. What you see is when you produce the gas in the plot below it, is that there's still red stuff left behind. And so that means the hydrogen is left, be left behind when you produce your CO2. You don't get all of it out again. And so this is kind of an issue is, you know, what is the proportion of hydrogen that you lose each time that you store the, the um, hydrogen into a um, sandstone rock? At this particular simulation, and we weren't optimizing it, you know, with special well design, we're finding that our model was predicting that we're losing between 20 and 30 percent each time that we put the hydrogen underground, which is quite a lot. You could probably optimize your well so you don't get those sort of losses, but um, it, it, you will certainly get losses which you don't get in a salt cavern. 
Um, the other thing is that when you produce your gas, you now have a mixture of the blue, red, and green. So of the hydrogen, your cushion gas, whatever that is, and also the methane that's already present there. So if that hydrogen is going back into a green steel plant or to an ammonia plant, then that has to be purified because the hydrogen that goes into those facilities needs to be pure. So that could add to the cost of storing underground. Okay, but I guess what that all points to, and you just saw this picture before, is that you know in Australia we have the ingredients right we can produce we have great resources to produce hydrogen we have salt that can support hydrogen storage we have iron ore resources they're all the ingredients for green steel and that's what we're going to be hearing a lot more about today um, if you ever make your way over to Canberra you're very welcome to come and have a look at some of these salt samples and these core samples it's open to the public. You just need to let us know and we can organize viewing of these different core samples. It's really cool to pick up a chunk of salt and go, wow, that's, I mean, I'm an engineer. So it's, even for me, it's kind of weird to pick up a chunk of salt and see a big chunk of salt. But anyway, um, yeah, so please come by. Um, it'd be really great to see. You. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I think it's, it's really fascinating to think how geological aspects like salt structures at depth can play a, a key role in deciding whether what the opportunities are for hydrogen mm -hmm. and how that varies across the country. And there's still clearly a lot of, I suppose, fundamental research to be done in order to understand those structures better. Um, we've got a, a couple minutes for, for questions, so I'll, I'll test the room to see if there's any takers. Alison? Oh, it was, yeah, some of that salt, oh, sorry. Yeah, some of that salt is really old, like you, like 780 million years old. Is that right, Peter? Yeah. Yeah. I should have said that when I pointed out those four different rocks, those different samples, there are, of course, other salt that has been picked around Australia. So it's not just limited to those four that we saw. And I guess this is the work that certainly um, Demirs is very interested in is mapping out what are the salt resources are in Western Australia. So there could be other locations that could hold these type of structures. We know from seismic and stuff that in the officer basin, although it's a lot more remote, um, there does seem to be really um, big salt structures down there. Offshore Bonaparte, so sort of off Darwin sort of area. There are all these dive piers up there, but they do. We recently, where's uh, Steph? Uh, yeah, we recently pulled out the cuttings from some of those wells and had a look at those, but it seems to be quite a lot of anhydrite in that. So that's actually 100% not suitable for salt storage because that contains sulfur. And if you put hydrogen and sulfur together, it's not pretty. Um, yeah, <laughs> so you really want just. Um, highlight. So the sodium chloride. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Just repeat the question for online. Oh, okay. Repeat the question. So the question was, um, uh, what about losses from salt caverns? Okay, so the thing about salt caverns is basically what you're building is a big tank underground. So unlike um, a sandstone where you're pushing it into the rock, which is, you know, could extend like 100 kilometers like you know or even you know kilometers scale at least you know you're pushing the hydrogen and it's going into that sandstone rock with salt it's a cap it's basically a big underground tank and so what happens is when you fill it initially with your hydrogen um, you never get all the hydrogen out again because you need to maintain a certain amount of pressure in the tank so you can't deplete the tank to you know 
very low pressures and then pulled back up again. And so that turns out to be when you first fill up the tank, you probably lose in the order of, and I think it was in my slides. So with the Moss Bluff one, about 40% of your hydrogen is kind of lost on the first fill. Now, each time you do it again, it's it's fine. So that over you know 20, 30 years, that that is that cost is ameritorized. I'm not good at multi-syllable words, sorry. Anyway, um, it's it's spread out over a very long time, and there is a correct word for that. Um, but yeah, but once it's in, then you can keep topping it up and back, up and back, and so it's it's fine. Yeah. Um, in in terms of losses, yeah, the tank is fantastic because salt tends to move, and in fact, the walls of these caverns over time will kind of creep in. And so sometimes what they have to do is they have to resolution mine the cavern after say 10 years to just pull out the walls again. So your tank is, goes back to the same size. So the salt moves and creates a really fantastic seal. That's why it's great. Yeah. So order of magnitude, what volumes are we talking about? A million cubic meters, 10 million? No, so uh, order of magnitude, you're talking about half a, cubi, half a million cubic meters, yeah. Yeah, that's and that would store around 5,000 tons of hydrogen. Yeah, depending on the pressure. So the shallow, shallower they are, you can't compress the hydrogen as much, so you don't get as much storage. But the deeper you go, you can compress the hydrogen more, and so you can store more. Uh, things. Question from Deirdre. Uh, So the question was, have we in risk, assessed the risk of induced seismicity? And the answer is no. Um, but that is definitely a, a, a very considerable factor about storing any gas underground is um, assessing that. I guess, you know, we do have experience of the other caverns overseas that they've been operational for, you know, some of them up for 30 years, but the geological conditions in Australia may be different and stresses may be different. So that's a really important thing to consider. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, there's a problem about the Australian Geological Survey. Yeah. Uh, the purity of hydrogen uh, doesn't matter if you're burning it. It's combustible. It doesn't matter the lots of fuel cells. Mm. So what's the purity of coming out of these sort of things? The, that's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head, but I think it's pretty good because it then feeds into like an ammonia plant or something like that. So it's not being used for combustion. I think the fuel cells have to be ammonia. Yeah. Yeah. So fuel cells is much higher, like in terms of the purity. Yeah. Thanks. There was one question online. I think that you answered it, but I'll just let you um, check. Uh, what happens to the 20 to 30 percent of hydrogen lost in each cycle? Is it leaking from the depleted? Is it leaking from depleted gas reservoirs? No. So it's not leaking. That's that's. So the question was. Oh well, maybe you would have heard the question. So I'm not going to repeat the question. Um, but the question is, is it leaking? It's not leaking. It's just being pushed further and further away from your well bore, where you're basically pulling the hydrogen out of, right? So it just gets pushed further and further away from you. Yeah, within the, but it is contained still within your reservoir. You're just not pulling it back out again. Does that, does that, does that imply that you, you um, lose your losses are greater over time? If you leave it at six months or 12 months? Um, yeah, the, so the question was, are your losses greater over time? It depends. So some people have simulated that you fill up an entire depleted gas field with hydrogen, like you're storing like hundreds of thousands of tons or a million tons of hydrogen underground, which is an insane amount of hydrogen. So I don't think we'll see that. But if you did that, then you're pushing everything out of the way and then your losses will be much, much lower, right? Because it's everything's pushed out of the way. But if you're only storing several thousand tons, then, well, our simulations suggest anyway that you're not, the losses uh, decrease over time, but they're still quite significant. Um, okay, so all right. There was a study from um, Glenn up the top a bit earlier about um, 
as we mentioned in Lynn, Lynn's site. Yeah. And um, I think what he, Glenn said that if, uh, sorry, not Glenn, Gary Wheatley mentioned if anyone would like info in respect of the Lynn H2 technology, including storage, he's, um, he's indicated more than happy for you to reach out directly to him. Fantastic. Yeah. So Gary's from Linda. Yeah. Good guy to know. All right. Okay. Thanks a lot. Our next presenter uh, is uh, Peter uh, Grubnik. So uh, Peter is uh, the strategy advisor for the Future Fuels CRC and project lead for the uh, CSIRO's High Resource, a collaborative knowledge sharing resource supporting the development of Australia's uh, hydrogen industry. Um, I believe Peter's joining us online. Before I actually begin the uh, presentation proper, uh, if I may, um, on the first slide, just introduce um, High Resource and High R R Research. They're both um, portals under the Knowledge Centre of the CSIRO Hydrogen Industry Mission. High Resource uh, contains a, a comprehensive catalogue of Australian um, hydrogen industry projects uh, of local and global um, hydrogen related policy to developments uh, and also a, uh, a very comprehensive um, catalogue of public support programs um, related to hydrogen in Australia, uh, prepared with the um, uh, Department of uh, Climate Change, Energy and Water. High research uh, is, a, is a comprehensive listing of Australian hydrogen related R&D projects, uh, as well as containing a projects based um, capability measure, uh, essentially a measure of, re of research intensity across the um, hydrogen industry value chain. If I can now get to the presentation proper, uh, acknowledgement of country, uh, and I'd like to begin the presentation by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today. Uh, I would also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, the, ah, this has got fancy type stuff. Um, oh, Sorry, um, this has got um, some animation in it, which uh, seems to be confusing me, I'm afraid. Um, the Does that come through? No, um, no, it's a shame. I, it's a very neat slide uh, that, that basically makes the point that there is very considerable alignment across state, territory and federal hydrogen strategies. Uh, all the key jurisdictions uh, have published or released hydrogen strategies or similar in the 2019-2021 period. Uh, and they all, they're all very consistent in terms of their strategic focus. So that's a very important point to make uh, that, 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 that alignment uh, across all the key jurisdictions in Australia. Um, the, the National Hydrogen Strategy that was released in 2019 uh, is currently undergoing a refresh, uh, and that should be um, uh, released uh, in the first part of 2024. The funding support programs, public funding support programs uh, for hydrogen uh, are quite 
considerable. I'll focus just on the hydrogen specific support uh, that specifically targets um, hydrogen projects and applications for funding. Uh, you'll notice a total of um, just over 8.4 billion uh, made up of 3.7 billion and 4.7 billion for the um, the latter for the states and territories. Um, a couple of quick points on the main parameters uh, in each of those. Um, for the Commonwealth, um, the main the main avenues of support are the um, two billion dollars um, recently allocated in the May budget for the hydrogen Head Start program. And over five hundred million dollars uh, that have been um, uh, allocated uh, under the regional hydrogen hubs program. For well, the states and territories, uh, that that four point seven billion is is made up in large part from from two items. Uh, one is three billion dollars. Uh, of incentives um, in support of hydrogen industry development um, through the New South Wales hydrogen strategy. Uh, and the strategy notes things like uh, exemptions from government charges. Uh, there's roughly $600 million um, from South Australia uh, allocated to the construction of their um, hydrogen power station in in uh, what in Wyala, so they're the top ranking um, federal and sort of state support measures. Trying to get onto the next slide. Let's have a quick snapshot um, of of the industry projects. At the moment, high resource contains around 120, 110, sorry, uh, industry projects that cover all stages of the project life cycle. Um, and by all stages, uh, I mean um, projects which are under development that have not yet reached a final investment decision. Projects that have reached a final investment decision and are under construction. And those projects that have moved from construction have done their commissioning work and are in operation. So they're the three main categories. Um, there is one project that is completed, um, uh, which is the hydrogen energy supply chain pilot project in Victoria. So all the major end uses are, are represented, uh, as you'll see in the pie chart. Uh, and most of the leading projects uh, are part supported uh, in large part or small part uh, by government um, support programs. Um, the, the end use opportunities, it's very difficult to be exact about end use opportunities. Many projects have uh, a number of end uses. Uh, what the pie chart tries to do is to sort of aggregated by by um, main use. Uh, so it's illustrative, but but a reasonably good illustration. And you can see from that um, the um, the strength of mobility, um, domestic mobility uses um, and the and export as a main focus and export being to a large extent ammonia, uh, but also including liquid hydrogen, and I think there's one or two gaseous hydrogen projects. Right, the life cycle analysis. Most of the projects of the 110 are under development. They have yet to reach a final investment decision. And that they're spread across development planning across the whole gamut from, pro from projects which are um, in the concept stages, projects which are at pre-feasibility stage, at feasibility stage, or which are currently 
uh, in front end engineering design feed. But the point to make is the bulk of the projects at this stage uh, are in the under development phase. They're, re they're dominated by renewables based projects, i.e. by ele electrolysis based projects. There's been steady progress uh, from projects in the development planning phase into under construction, and I'll sort of show one or two, two slides about that uh, later on. Um, so there has been steady progress. Um, the pace of implementation um, in Australia, like globally, has, um, I won't face certain issues is the sort of wrong terminology, but that there's been some common um, factors impacting uh, implementation. Um, so we're, we're all quite aware of um, infrastructure supply chain issues. Um, I'm led to believe in speaking to some proponents that um, there's quite a delay on um, electrolyzer supply from some overseas manufacturers. Um, permitting and uh, regulation are, 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 are things that one, one must always keep in mind when you're starting, uh, starting up a uh, sort of a new, a, a new industry. Uh, in reading project reports, and for those interested, um, high resource under projects does have a sub-level called um, project reports, and they are reports from projects um, about, um, about their project implementation, and they're very useful to read if, if you have the time. Um, and reading those reports, the issue, some of the issues around permitting and regulation relate to two issues. Uh, one is the process itself, working your way through the process. Um, the other point is making sure it's understood upfront exactly what you have to do to work your way through the process. So no, not a process issue per se, but having clarity upfront, all the steps that need to be done rather than getting to a stage and going, whoops, we've missed that step. Uh, and the, the sort of usual, again, in the early stage of these, um, in the early stage of the industry, uh, the devil in the detail in technology implementation. So the last two, you, you could actually assign to growing pains and learning, you know, learning from these growing pains and the next wave of pro projects should have it um, should be able to work through those processes a lot smoother. Let's take a trip back to the future, uh, to eighteen months ago. Um, eighteen months ago, we had eighty projects. Now we have one hundred and ten, so a lot more, a lot more, pro a lot more projects. Uh, importantly, what we're seeing is uh, we now have 28 projects operating or under construction versus 18 in December 2021. So, I, again, emphasising my point around steady progress um, into, into the uh, construction phase. And that's the key point I wanted to make there. What does that steady progress look like? Um, and here, I'm just focusing on operating and under construction. I'm not looking at projects which are under development, many of which have a high degree of speculation uh, about them around timing and timelines. But for those where we have clarity, uh, 28 projects, as I said, operating or under construction, uh, the operational profile that we have uh, indicates a significant 2023 to 2025 build up. And my focus here is on uh, electrolyzer based projects. There are, I think, one or two which aren't uh, electrolyzer based projects. So we, we're seeing a, a, uh, a rather strong 
build up over the next 18 months or so. Um, one or two of the projects that I have in 2023 may, get, may, um, may move out to 2024, uh, but the picture till 25 remains the same. There's around 30 to 35 megawatts of electrolysis capacity, and I'll use the word capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, production will not always match capacity, uh, but from a consistency point of view, uh, that's that's where we're at in terms of capacity of these uh, 25 or so, 26 or so electrolytic based projects. Now, the information I have in speaking to uh, proponents, I speak to them on a regular basis. There are pretty good prospects for positive final investment decisions, um, approved development plans um, from the permitting bodies um, as we progress through 2023. Uh, there's a couple of projects that are very optimistic. Uh, and that, that that is a strong si it, it, that's a strong signal for the projects then to progress to to under construction. So what does the next wave of projects look like? So we're seeing this sort of wave that we've had with projects moving into under construction um, in in 2022, uh, 21, 22. But what what does the next wave lo look like? Do we have any sort of indications for how that might look. Um, and the best way to try and approach this is to look at the projects which are in development planning and to segregate those projects between those which are in front end engineering the design, which is quite advanced in terms of development planning, and those which are in pre-feed, i.e. they're in concept definition, pre-feasibility or the feasibility study stage. Now, if you're in feed, uh, you've you've basically narrowed down your development to one option. You're doing some reasonably detailed engineering and technical studies on, on that option. You're progressing a, a procurement. Um, you're progressing a procurement and contracting strategy. You're progressing a construction strategy. And more importantly, you're progressing your cost estimates, particularly your capital cost. So you're progressing that whole body of work that enables uh, the principals to make a final investment decision. What we're seeing at this stage is, um, is a not inconsiderable number of projects which are, which are in feed or the equivalent stage. Now, I haven't been able to canvas all, all sort of 80 projects in development planning, uh, so it's in, in indicative of the, the data. Uh, so I'm not showing num numbers. The point of what I want to make is, is um, it, it is a, it is a, again, a not inconsiderable number of projects. It's electrolysis dominated. And a big advance from where we were 18 months ago in terms of the sort of capacity ranges which are being um, taken through uh, feed studies, uh, we now we now have um, a few projects which are at the very large scale level, um, beyond 100 megawatts, beyond 500 megawatts. Just one project. Stated. Okay, thank you. Uh, one project that is um, over one gigawatt. So, so in terms of where we are in this sort of planning stage now, compared to maybe two years ago, uh, much larger uh, pro pro projects going through feed. So, a profiling chart that basically, um, I'm not sure how how much it sort of tells you, but it's useful to put all this into context. The 2020s, when you look at the data, the 2020s is largely then about, in, in, in the Australian context, domestic demonstration and deployment. When we get to the late 2020s, uh, then we're looking at uh, this 
export potential growth, we're looking at the larger scale market, you know, market activation. Uh, that's the latter part of the 2020s uh, going into the 2030s. So important point for me to make here is that that's the illustrative profile of industry development in Australia. Second last slide, by research. Um, high research is devoted to R&D pro pro projects. At the moment, we're almost at 300 uh, R&D projects. I've just written one up that takes me to 299. Um, and they cover uh, more than 30 institutions and you know, research institutions and organisations. Extensive search functionality. You can search by research focus areas, lead org, funding program. Um, it also contains a capability um, a capability uh, page. And the capability page looks to align research focus areas across the across the um, hydrogen value chain. And you'll see one of the heat maps we have there on the side. You can't read the data, but it basically aligns research focus areas with lead organisation with um, each of the key elements of the hydrogen value chain. And then there's more detailed heat maps, which uh, breaks that down. There's something like 65 um, research focus areas that we break down. Uh, and, and, and those, um, those um, high capability measure it, it, it is essentially a portrayal of research intensity. And my Can final you, uh, slide, and, up, I, and I'm getting very, I'm getting very thirsty. Thank you for your time. So I do need a drink. <laughs> Perfect. And I can get some hydrogen water. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Wrong button. No, I'm sorry about that yeah. earlier slide. Yeah. It's a very neat on. slide. And I put you on mute. Um, I think it's uh, it's really great to go from the, the science to see, uh, I suppose, a, an overview of the industry. Um, it seems like there's activity happening all across Australia, but very early days. Um, and I think the uh, the figure that stuck in my mind was 35 megawatts of, of capacity by 2025. I think that's something to keep in mind as we're going through the day. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll have to um, move on. Chris Simkus, who's the manager of Hydrogen Initiatives and the National Hydrogen Review Task Force, at the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water. With over 17 years in the Australian public service, his experience spans clean energy finance policy, statutory oversight of government agencies, funding programs, national telecommunications policy, quantitative model and modeling and infrastructure um, deployment. So over to you, Chris. Uh, thanks a lot, and uh, thank you for inviting me to come along. I take it you can get a quick thumbs up to make sure you can see the slides and hear me. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So Chris Simkus, and currently one of the one of the part of the team that's uh, reviewing and refreshing the National Hydrogen Strategy, and uh, it's being led out of the Australian Government's Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment, and Water. Uh, but we're doing it really in close consultation with the states and territories who each have their own hydrogen units. And you know, ever since the 2019 strategy came out, we have been working uh, quite closely in a, in a uh, almost surprisingly open book fashion with with, uh, with our colleagues there. So hoping uh, to long continue that uh, through this refresh exercise. Uh, so in this presentation, I was going to give an overview of the current state of play of the hydrogen industry and provide a bit of a snapshot of opportunities and priorities and really just provide a bit of an overview of the, uh, uh, the hydrogen policy landscape in Australia. Uh, uh, but first, just acknowledge the Ngunnawal people as the traditional custodians of the land that I'm joining you from, recognising we're a little bit dispersed and uh, recognise that any uh, any other people or families in connection to the lands of the ACT region and acknowledge and welcome Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending today's events. Uh, so current, as you all know, uh, current hydrogen policy or contemporary hydrogen policy in Australia really got its start 
uh, following the release of the 2019 hydrogen strategy. It was a, a combined effort between uh, federal portfolios and the states and territories and set in motion an adaptive approach to uh, taking uh, early actions and no regret actions to activate the industry domestically such that it'd be well placed to spring into a rapid scaling up once international demand showed up sometime in the latter half of the decade. And since, since then, the Australian government has progressed uh, most of the actions in the strategy, many of which have been done in quite uh, close collaboration, as I said, with the states and territories and also uh, with a number of industry players, including the Australian Hydrogen Council, who we are in reg regular dialogue with. There's too many to list, uh, but some of the important ones uh, are shown here and include you know, providing some initial funding for the establishment of hydrogen hubs, uh, initiating some international partnerships surrounding hydrogen, reviewing and looking at our legal frameworks for hydrogen production and use, uh, which has now progressed onto developing a series of model codes of best practice, uh, again with the states and territories. Uh, we've established an annual reporting and monitoring framework through the State of Hydrogen Report. Uh, we've done some initial analysis into social license, skills and training. And we've also completed the first National Hydrogen Infrastructure Assessment. Just on that last one, um, yeah, relevant to this, uh, this forum is uh, the use of hydrogen in iron and steel manufacturing accounts for one of the, the key hydrogen usage sectors that we built into the National Hydrogen Infrastructure Assessment. Uh, yeah. Essentially, as, as you know, there with substantial ore reserves, uh, fossil fuel reserves, CCS, solar, wind resources, and the potential for, for hydrogen production here, the modelling assumed that uh, a proportion of future iron ore export uh, would now be used to make steel domestically rather than offshore. So just to reiterate, this, these were assumptions, not the current policy positions, but the modelling assumed around 13% of iron ore, uh, which production of which also increased, was used to make green steel by 2050. Uh, yeah, essentially, this was in line with IEA scenarios, uh, which expect steel demand to increase by around 12% by 2050. Uh, and also Grattan uh, Institute suggesting that Australia could potentially capture 6.5% of the global green steel market, which would uh, use around 13% of Australian iron ore. So the modelling basically, hide, I won't dwell too long on, on this particular study, but the modelling basically highlights the amount of hydrogen required to process the current amount of iron ore. This amount of iron ore is, is pretty massive uh, and, and to produce green steel would be really high. Uh, from an infrastructure perspective, which is really the point of the study, the results really uh, point ultimately uh, to the insufficiency of uh, renewable energy zones uh, identified, for example, in the Pilbara region. So that just get, yeah, that's just the sort of outcome, the sort of thinking that has been done over the last couple of years, and where it's where it's pointing to in terms of uh, finding infrastructure solutions uh, to uh, you know, promote the green iron, green steel uh, option uh, opportunity that we have. A lot of our recent activities are also described in our state recent state of hydrogen report, which is uh, all centered around an independent assessment of our progress against 13 metrics uh, identified in the strategy and the CSIRO operationalized that for us. Um, the, uh, the, the very first state of hydrogen produced the year before, 2021, uh, mostly highlighted Pretty early indications of future success. Uh, there was a lot of private sector investment uh, or announcements of, uh, and you know, a lot of public sector announcements as well. And there was gigawatt scale projects that had been announced, and investment was being channeled into supply chain studies and feed studies, that sort of thing, all the sorts of things you would expect from a nice, from a healthy industry. This year's report, or the most recent report, so it's kind of fast forwarding a year. Uh, essentially showed a bit of a slowing in progress. So five indicators sh uh, slowed down compared to the previous year. Six were unchanged and four of which were really at the slowest rate in the assessment. Um, so in short, and Deloitte did this assessment for us, uh, you know, really suggest we might have slipped uh, a, a little bit in terms of our, yeah, our, our progress. Um, we, 
you know, and uh, while we've got the might have the largest pipeline of announced projects in the world when it comes to actual delivery, we we tend to rank a little bit behind Western Europe, East Asia, and North America, uh, with the effects of the IR Act in the states being more obvious uh, now. We'd probably have to have a, a pretty close look at how realistic the pipeline that we we uh, presented at the time actually is. Um, the, yeah, essentially the main issue is cost competitiveness of hydrogen relative to equivalent fossil fuel technologies and poor cost competitiveness is leading to the relatively slow rate of, of large projects reaching FID. Uh, it's not a, not a unique problem uh, to Australia in, in, its, uh, in its essence, but uh, many jurisdictions such as the US, and Canada, EU, UK and Germany are implementing financial incentive mechanisms to stimulate the investment and to essentially address this issue. Uh, this is a Geoscience Australia workshop, so here you'll probably see the blandest map of Australia you'll see all day. Uh, but uh, Australia is just there to illustrate that Australian government financial support of hydrogen industry to date has been primarily through capital expenditure grants including through the Regional Hydrogen Hubs program, which provided uh, north of 500 billion towards the establishment of, of eight hydrogen hubs, uh, as well as a range uh, up to, I think it's nine feasibility stud studies in, in support of future hydrogen hubs. Um, so, I mean, the hydrogen hub concept is really aimed at uh, creating economies of scale uh, to drive down costs of production uh, and costs of supporting infrastructure. And it's not uh, unique to Australia either, but there's plans for hydrogen hubs also progressing in a number of countries, including the US, UK, Germany, Netherlands, Japan and India. Now, I, I think my, my uh, assessment is that uh, these investments were largely welcome, but uh, the new hydrogen Head Start production credit program is a, is a pretty exciting addition. Uh, that uh, we really expect uh, we'll start addressing some of the issues that I've listed mentioned before and make it a lot easier for some of these large scale projects to move beyond announcement to uh, reach a financial investment decision. So uh, this program, Hydrogen Head Start, is really one of the most significant government investments in the in hydrogen industry to date and is a pretty well clear signal of government support and determination to grow the industry. Uh, just quickly, you know, Hydrogen Head Start, it's obviously designed to provide projects with a, a production credit, which should assist with bridging the gap between the current cost of hydrogen and what an off taker may currently be willing to pay. This uh, gap is what we call uh, the hydrogen production credit. And uh, in, in the recently uh, uh, recent consultation process and around the program, um, yeah, uh, the HPC or the hydrogen production credit uh, yeah, effectively represents a dollar per kilogram of hydrogen or hydrogen derived product, uh, which is the blue box there. And while it's not shown in this diagram, obviously, then that individual credit is then multiplied by the volume of hydrogen to, to give you the total amount paid out. Uh, it's, it was proposed and obviously the team is sitting down uh, synthesizing uh, the final guidelines for the program which need to go back to government for for a uh, final approval but uh, it's proposed that uh, the funding will be paid quarterly in arrears based on actual production in that quarter and it will last over a 10-year term So funding for hubs and hydrogen head start are two of the bigger policy elements of the hydrogen policy landscape. Uh, but the, one of the other ones is uh, the current review of the national hydrogen strategy, which I'm working on. Uh, we're pick up, picking up a lot of the themes and observations laid down in the state of hydrogen and indeed uh, formed part of the rationale for the hydro hydrogen head start program and effectively bringing it uh, forward ahead of the strategy. Uh, so really in mind is just the consensus uh, opinion that Australia is still well placed to play a significant role in the global hydrogen industry due to our energy resources, our land, our track record and proximity to markets. We're also uh, given the shifts in you know, climate 
policy and industry policy. Hydrogen, clearly, hydrogen has, a, has an important role in achieving our net zero emissions uh, objective and really particularly uh, important for hard to abate sectors that can't easily be electrified. We, we do have a large announcement pipeline, which at least at one point was estimated to be valued in the hundreds of billions. So it seems at the very least there's a uh, good solid case to put, to uh, double down and pursue these. Uh, and as I said before, uh, in mind uh, in kicking off the review is that hydrogen is not quite cost competitive with, with fossil fuels yet. Uh, while we're, uh, Australia might have been third nation to publish a hydrogen strategy in 29, 2019, uh, there's there's much more than 30 uh, countries that have now released hydrogen strategies and we're aware that there's many more in development or internal documents. So uh, the yeah, level of competition is, is increasing substantially since 2019. And as a result, it's quite clear to us uh, that industry is really looking for some long-term policy certainty through the strategy. The strategy original strategy was obviously meant to be adaptive, so it's it's after four years, uh, it's entirely reasonable that we pick it up and have a look at it and see if it's still fit for purpose given the amount of change. And moving along, it well, it also, it's worth noting that it's an opportunity to consider new ideas that were, yeah, weren't able to be canvassed uh, four years ago or weren't even, uh, uh, hadn't even been thought of at the time. So a lot has changed. So we want to pick up all these issues and run with them. This is a bit processy, but uh, hopefully just provides a bit of insight into how we work through these, how we're working through this uh, policy initiative. We've effectively taken the Energy and Climate Ministerial Council's specific task in relation to conducting the review and operationalized it into some cross-cutting strategic objectives and uh, a range of work streams sitting underneath these and each of which contain uh, multiple issues that we're currently considering. considering. So the str strategic objectives really are that uh, we develop a strategy that uh, uh, looks at uh, ensuring we get economic benefit through the development of the industry, we get domestic decarbonisation through the development of the industry and in terms of posture, we're on the path to we're still on the path to being a global leader by 2030, and that's quite significant uh, given the amount of uh, policy intervention and measures going on globally. So, uh, as I said, we've got a range of uh, work streams that we're uh, that we are working through. Uh, there's a lot of individuals sitting underneath them, but in, just in terms of thinking about green iron and green steel, there's a number of touch points, uh, and the, really the main ones uh, is, and yeah, just to give you some insight into how you can engage with the process is just firstly, uh, you, would have, you would have seen in our consultation paper that while hydrogen can be used for a lot of applications, we're thinking that it may be more effective and efficient to identify priority use sectors where there is a substantial decarbonisation potential and or economic potential. Um, you will have seen that we've called out green iron and steel making as one of these potential priorities. And this is largely, we think there's a prima facie case there that we've, we're testing uh, based on the fact that we're the world's largest iron ore producer. We can play a, a significant role in transitioning steel making to uh, effectively a net zero emissions industry uh, and that there's considerable you know, potential to uh, establish new onshore uh, clean uh, iron ore and steel producing uh, processing industries using our renewables and, and our clean hydrogen to uh, really add value to the hydrogen and, and add value to the iron ore exports. Uh, we're also having a bit of a think uh, about critical technologies that will be needed by hydrogen production and hydrogen use sectors. We want to have an idea about the technologies that are going to be critical over the medium to long term, yet require some action now to ensure that either we develop it or ide and, and ideally protect the IP we develop in country, but also uh, ensure we can access key technologies developed over, overseas. 
Uh, we're looking a bit. Uh, at, one more minute, Chris. OK. Uh, looking at our comparative advantage through a global trade lens. And we're also thinking about the pathway for building out the guarantee of origin scheme to provide uh, further uh, to, you know, to, to support further hydrogen embodied products. Uh, I won't say a great deal, obviously, guarantee of origin I've just mentioned. We are obviously engaging internationally and domestically to, to advance this scheme, uh, taking a lead role uh, through the IPHE uh, forum. Uh, and our scheme is uh, heavily based on those methodologies. Ex expect a bit more consultation on the final design to come out in the not too distant future. Maybe just a final slide. So as I mentioned, just in terms of our consultation paper, it covers a fair bit of territory and asks quite a lot of questions. Uh, in general, the response is quite positive to the ideas we've we've raised or seeded at least. We've got about we've got north of 100 written submissions so far, with a few more trickling in as well. Uh, obviously, a wide range of views on priorities, barriers, and opportunities for the Australian economy, but there's some some major themes, um, you know, I think in terms of sectoral decarbonisation, uh, the, the view really is that the hydrogen strategy can lay a bit of a foundation for the sectoral plans you would have seen announced recently, uh, as with hydrogen as a, a significant enabler. Uh, the focus on priority sectors seems to make sense to a lot of people, particularly ones where there's basically no regrets or there's no alternative other than hydrogen. So whether that's ammonia or high high temperature heat applications, it's kind of mixed views on the role of hydrogen in balancing uh, the grids. Uh, but we should yeah definitely uh, look into that issue as to whether you know, electrolyzers, for example, can provide a flexible load. Exporting hydrogen uh, in its in that form remains uh, an opportunity people are keen to pursue, as well as uh, looking at the merits of producing uh, other products with hydrogen. There's obviously a sharp divide uh, in terms of on the green versus blue hydrogen debate, which I imagine will continue for some time. In general, uh, there's you know, really warm reception to the hydrogen Head Start program, but uh, uh, people still flagging the need for additional capex and opex support from government. And interestingly, just finally, uh, yeah, we've sort of suggested the use of targets and and mandates, potentially aspirational, but also in a regulatory sense. So hard hard targets, hard mandates, and surprisingly, it's very few stakeholders that have an out, outright opposition to this sort of thing. So that, that was possibly a little bit of a surprise for us, but except that uh, as we work through some of these submissions and these ideas, that probably the devil will be in the detail for a lot of stakeholders. Uh, so a bit of an overview, might leave it at that. Sounds like uh, the coffee uh, pot is beckoning, so we don't have too much time for <laughs> questions, <laughs> but uh, uh, Thanks. Thanks, Chris. I'll leave it there. So uh, yeah, it's, it's really important. <laughs> really important to um, understand Australia's uh, positioning and posture, uh, I think, as we're thinking about the, the context to this workshop. I know everyone is, is keen to get to the morning tea, but I understand we've got Peter uh, has stayed online. So are there any burning questions um, that anyone wants to ask? Uh, Chris, is there a discussion around hydrogen classification scheme? So as a question for Chris, is there any discussion around a hydrogen classification scheme? Uh, well, look, most of the discussion, if I understand the question, uh, would be in around how we how we use the guarantee of origin scheme and what attributes of the hydrogen uh, we associate with the with that scheme. Which yeah can obviously be really simple, can be straight emissions, but then you can branch it right out until and include all sorts of parameters. And also around the um, the, the colours, the the blue hydrogen, green hydrogen. Yeah, so I mean at the moment we've we've the government's committed to a guarantee of origin scheme, uh, which you know, you know, kind of suggests you're going to have uh, a variety of uh, 
of different colors, if you like, happening and that people are going to want to make a an educated decision on that. And I think at least that's the position stated in the 2019 strategy. And uh, there seems to be broad support for that approach going forward. But uh, that's obviously, as I said, there's a sharp divide on on uh, the green versus blue uh, situation. So it's one one to watch, I would say. One last one. Just want to make a comment that colours are really expensive. The international service of technical community, there aren't any colours. If you want to buy a measure of quality of the hydrogen, there's so much CO2 emissions are associated with the central hydrogen. So a, a comment that the uh, that the colours are uh, meaningless, and particularly in the context of the international community and, and classification yeah. schemes. Welcome everybody to our uh, second session of the morning. This session is going to be focusing on geoscience modeling and pre-competitive data discovery. Uh, and in particular, introducing some of our uh, economic fairways work, um, some of the techno-economic modeling that we've been undertaking and debuting the green steel economic fairways model. Uh, I'm going to introduce all, uh, all of the speakers for this session. So first of all, we'll be hearing from Stuart Walsh. Stuart is a senior lecturer in the Resources Engineering Department at Monash University. Uh, Stuart is an applied math mathematician and has been the technical lead in the Economic Fairways project between Monash University and Geoscience Australia. Uh, Chang Long uh, Wang is a research fellow at Monash University, specializing in energy system modeling. Chang Long is also a uh, climate future fellow at the University of Melbourne. Chang Long serves as one of uh, two Australian representatives on the International Energy uh, Agency's Hydrogen Implement uh, Agreement, Task 41, which focuses on the analysis and modelling of hydrogen technologies. Uh, and I'll also be the third speaker. I introduce myself this morning. <laughs> Marcus Haynes, pleased to meet you. Um, Stuart, over to you. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, you should have learnt Marcus's spiel before we came up here. Um, good to meet everyone. Uh, yes, I am an applied mathematician. Don't hold it against me. Sorry about that. Um, uh, I am going to be presenting today, and I get the fortunate role of sort of leading all of this. Uh, one of the things I want to say at the start is that, obviously, uh, we've got a few names up there, but to be honest, we've been working on this project for a number of years now, um, and almost too many names to sort of fit on there. But between Geoscience Australia and Monash University, I just want to say thank you to many people who are represented here today for your support over the years, and um, you know, and for those who are online as well, thank you for your support too. So, uh, but today we're going to basically be talking about sort of three different things. Uh, I'm going to give a bit of a history of how we came to this point and the sorts of models that we've been developing up until now and the philosophy that we're hoping to bring to this new green steel mapper. Um, and then we'll pass over to Chung Wong, and uh, Chung Wong will basically be diving in a little bit more into the details of what we're actually modeling, what we're gonna be uh, presenting on the portal. And then finally, Marcus will be going over the details of the portal implementation itself and showing some of the analyses that you can actually do um, when you're online. And hopefully uh, then we'll have an opportunity to play around with it. Fingers crossed it doesn't crash. <laughs> as well. uh, but what we're really looking for from everyone here and everyone online today is uh, feedback. Right? We're still very much in, I don't know if we're at alpha or beta, but we're early on in the process uh, and we're trying to work out what it is that everyone in this room wants to see in a tool like this, what you think would be a good addition to these types of analysis, um, you know, what would make this tool better. So anything that you can provide in terms of feedback or ways forward would be fantastic. Um, but before we dive into that, um, many of you, I'm guessing, don't know who we are or what we do. So a bit of a background in terms of that. Um, basically, we're interested in uh, developing uh, tools to understand Australia's role in the energy transition, our progress in the energy transition, but more than that, to identify opportunities where Australian companies and investment in Australia can benefit um, for new projects in the energy transition as well. And to that end, We've basically been working on a couple of different software tools. Uh, the two that I'm going to focus on mostly today are the Heft and BlueCap code and the Mural X uh, codes. Uh, Heft and BlueCap are basically regional economic uh, mappers. They look for regional economic potential to highlight areas of very large scale. Oh, should I talk more into the mic? Regional <laughs> areas on a large scale 
uh, where there might be benefit uh, to create uh, a new project uh, from an economic perspective. Uh, Mural X is more of a sort of site specific optimization tool. Uh, which allows you to sort of dive into the details of how you might want to optimize a particular plant or a particular process configuration uh, around the production of these new green commodities. And then finally, we've got another tool called Exporter, which we're not really going to go into much detail about today, but basically that deals with um, the export and trade market. The reason I mention it, though, is it goes into some of the details that Chung Long will be talking about in his presentation, basically it guides some of uh, the costs around um, the uh, export of different commodities from Australia to different countries around the world. Uh, but this journey that we've had so far with Geoscience Australia um, actually didn't begin with, well, it began with one of these codes. It began with uh, the Blue Cap code. And I checked my emails, it actually dates back five years, almost five years now, um, that we've been working on this particular project. And the idea behind uh, Blue Cap was basically we wanted to work out a way where um, into Geoscience Australia's assessments of geological potential, could we also bring alongside that assessments of economic potential for new projects, project development? Um, and so working with Geoscience Australia and their fantastic data sets, uh, we came up with a new model for doing that, not just a single location or a set of locations, but actually in a mapping format to be able to apply that type of analysis across very large regions, in fact, across all of Australia all at once. Um, but also working with Geoscience Australia, we got in sort of the mindset of the pre-competitive data, open data mindset that Geoscience Australia likes to bring to these types of projects, which is we wanted to make these tools very readily accessible, um, not just to people in academia, not just to people in Geoscience Australia, but to the general public, to investors, to companies, to people in government as well. Uh, and to that end, um, well, I like to say that we worked at it, but really it was the efforts of Geoscience Australia to take our tools and put them online and make them accessible uh, and allow you to play around with those tools uh, through their portal uh, that meant we could actually distribute these tools to the more broader public. At the same time, we also recognise that um, the types of analysis that we do, uh, often people have different opinions about what the cost should be that go into different components of these models, how you should be doing these analyses, or even lots of applications you should be um, applying them to. Uh, and so we took the, the source code and the, low, uh, the source code that uh, runs all of these models and we made it publicly available as well. And so if you're interested in doing some other form of analysis or if you're interested in trying out something a little bit different, you can take that source code and adapt it to your own needs and your own applications as well. Um, one of the things we realized quite early on in this process though was that while we could apply these regional assessments in the mineral space, it wasn't just limited to the mineral space. We could broaden our horizons and we can also think about other areas of application as well. And one of the early ones that we seized upon was the renewable energy space, and in particular development of new hydrogen projects. Uh, and to that end, we developed uh, the Hydrogen Economic Fairways modeling tool, or the Hydrogen Economic Fairways mapper. And basically what it does is it again performs these sorts of regional assessment, but based around the production of green hydrogen and blue hydrogen as well. Basically, we take a model of um, the cash flows into and out of the plant over the course of its lifetime. We run that model, we exercise it a whole bunch of times in order to generate a bunch of lookup functions. And then we combine those lookup functions with um, regional maps of resource potential, both in terms of solar potential and wind potential. But we also combine that with maps of uh, distance to infrastructure, um, distance to uh, roads, to rail, uh, transportation distances to port, distances to water as well. And bringing all of those things together, we come up with regional maps of economic potential. Um, but again, we didn't want to just take these models and sort of keep them in-house. We wanted to make them broadly accessible to everyone else. And as I think we've already heard a little bit about today, um, working with Geoscience Australia, we again took these models, put them online and made them available through uh, the Hydrogen Economic Fairways tool, which I think benefits because it's got a great acronym, actually. I think that's the main reason uh, we did really well with that. So HEFT is that one. Um, and this, again, allows people to come online, play around with the tool, look at the different input assumptions and see what that means for economic potential for these different projects in different particular locations. This also means that, again, we've got this 
um, source code that you can take offline and if there's other sorts of analyses that you might want to do or you might have your own confidential data sets those sorts of things that you want to run on this tool you can do that as well however having created heft and also having created blue cap we were always searching for the intersection of these two studies so where could we find an intersection between green energy and also mineral potential as well and an obvious one um, was the production of green iron and green steel. Now, very early on in this process, um, we decided to do a relatively simple study. Uh, we went to Allison's actually in the room. So we went to Allison and said, uh, could we have a, a, a map that sort of showed the locations of where the major iron ore deposits are around Australia? Uh, we took those iron ore deposits, we mapped them, we plotted them like that. And then at the same time, we ran some analysis looking at where uh, the best places around Australia would be for local hydrogen production. And so here we've mapped those out. You can sort of see local hydrogen production from solar resources, from wind resources, and a combination of wind and solar. And what I find, what I personally find really, really striking about this is the strong correspondence between locations of these, these mines, these major mining systems, and uh, locations of where we would like to produce hydrogen or where we think it's beneficial to produce hydrogen. Now, I know some of you, uh, probably scratching their heads and saying, well, what does mining have to do with renewable energy? It doesn't necessarily mean that the two go hand in hand. Now, if you're an iron ore miner, you probably already know the answer, that the sun shines more brightly on iron ore mines, and so that's why we should develop new projects there. But for the rest of us, maybe we need some other form of explanation. Uh, and the answer is, well, it's not actually that we have necessarily better renewable energy at those particular locations. As I can tell you from my own experience this morning, Australia is a very, very big place. It takes a long time to fly from Melbourne all the way over to Perth. Um, and we don't actually lack for all good renewable resources. We have lots and lots of places around Australia where we have excellent world-class renewable resources and combinations of wind and solar that other countries would give their eye teeth uh, to have within their own borders. What we do lack though is infrastructure. We're such a big country, a lot of the places where we might like to develop a new renewable project are actually a long way away from rail, road, water, those sorts of things that we actually need to make a hydrogen project successful. So what brings that infrastructure to a particular location? Well, it's investment. What brings investment to regional Australia? Often it's the presence of a large mining, um, a large mine in that particular area. Um, and you can sort of also see that too, because while we don't have the marked up there, you can see Mount Isa and Tennant Creek also highlighted on those maps as well. And again, that's because the regional infrastructure around there, uh, again, makes it more favorable for the production of hydrogen in those locations too. So having identified this, which we thought was a really cool result, we wanted to go further though. We wanted to understand a little bit more about what it would actually mean to develop a new green iron or green steel project at those particular locations. And that meant going a little bit deeper. So yes, we can do the same sorts of analysis that we're doing with heft and that we're doing uh, with the economic fairways tool, but that, and this is some of the detail that we actually need to understand what the levelized cost of steel will be at those particular locations. We need to understand a little bit more about different regional differences between one location and the next. In fact, what we need to dive into is variations in the solar and wind resources at those locations and how we balance out that with the amount of battery storage we might need or hydrogen storage or the size of our plant in general. All of those sorts of things are important considerations when we're sort of thinking about the optimum uh, design conditions at a particular location. So how do we model that? Well, that's where our next tool comes into play and five minutes ago, cool. Um, and I'm gonna steal hopefully not too much, but a little bit of Chung Long's thunder here, uh, when the answer is coming from Muriel. Um, so the idea here is that what Muriel does is it doesn't do regional assessments. Rather, what it does is it takes in uh, a profile of renewable energy, wind and solar power over time on an hourly basis, and then a particular plant, whether that be a green iron or steel or some other green commodity plant, and then works out what the optimal conditions, the optimal sizing of each of those components should be. Uh, and it's a fantastic model, right? I can say that because, again, Zhang Long is uh, the main developer of that particular code. Um, but it uh, allows you to analyze these different profiles at different locations around Australia, but also internationally, 
And we can also tie it up with that earlier code I was telling you about to talk about what it would take to actually export some of these commodities internationally and what that would mean for the price as well. Um, so again, we can sort of compare what it would mean to produce steel in Japan versus in Australia versus green iron in Australia versus India versus wherever you want to go. And not only that, once you've done all of these things, it will actually tell you what the sort of profile of production is over time in terms of energy production and storage and all those sorts of things at the plant. So great, great tool. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite fit in what we want to do with Geoscience Australia. We can't make it publicly available in the same way we can make the other tools publicly available. Why? Because it's just too expensive and too computationally intensive to actually run it on lots and lots and lots of different examples. So what can we do instead? Well, one thing we realized is we can isolate part of it. We can isolate a component of that model called the forward model. So basically, once you've got your plant configuration up, uh, once you understand something about how big you want everything to be built, you can run that model forward and you can see what that means for how much steel you're going to produce and what the levelized cost of steel is going to be at a particular location. Uh, and this is basically the tool that we're going to be making available through the Geoscience Australia portal. And again, Marcus is going to go into more of the sorts of analysis that you can do with this particular tool as well. And I can sort of see that I'm running out of time, so I'll finish up. Um, I just want to finish up by sort of saying it's not just about steel, it's about other commodities as well. Obviously, iron, we've talked a lot about green iron and green steel, but we can extend this type of analysis to all every sort of mineral or metal that you're interested in, as well as other things like cement and ammonia, and obviously back to hydrogen as well. Um, so with that, I'm an academic, so I'm going to finish off with a plug for all our papers. Please cite them frequently. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass across to Shang Long Wang, who's going to be talking a little bit about the Mira model and all of the components that go into that too. Hi, everyone. My name is Chang Long Wang. I'm a research fellow at Monash University. Uh, firstly, I want to, uh, as Tewa mentioned, I want to introduce you to this uh, Mirial tool, which is really computationally expensive. And secondly, uh, the, uh, the forward model that we're going to show a live demo today. Um, <clears throat> Australia has abandoned wind and solar resources. We, we all know that. But in the carbon constrained world, Australia can export its renewable resources as well, maybe in the form of green hydrogen, green ammonia, also energy embodied products. So our study shows Australia has a unique advantage in this global race, and the potential is enormous. So in our submission to the National Hydrogen Strategy Review, we highlighted the uh, value-added hydrogen export, which is the ammonia, also uh, green steel. So what value can Australia add in this um, hydrogen export? Undoubtedly, is it the land, renewable resources, the iron ore, also interesting the seasonal complementarity of the green commodities. What, am I, what I mean by that, actually, uh, in particular, Australia's solar reaches peak uh, in the summer when the Northern Hemisphere solar plant is in their winter, and the demand is skyrocketed because they have lots of heating. So this creates a demand supply gap where Australia solar can just fill that gap perfectly. So this is in the paper, uh, just uh, showing there. Happy for you to reference it. <laughs> so in terms of green steel, uh, in our study, we find is, you know, if Australia were to replace just 1% of current global steel production, it would require or optimize 30 gigawatts of wind and solar resources. So you see the potential, but you also see the challenge because the scale is huge. The problem is scaling up present challenges. The largest electrodes that operating in Australia is only 1.25 megawatt today. So we need you know, hundreds of gigawatts of electrodes to become that green steel industry. But we, you know, we just need to scale up. So to enable growth, we believe acceptable tools uh, will be critical to accelerate the, uh, the growth of the industry, especially from its infancy. And also, we want to attract international investments. The HAT tool does a fantastic job identifying the high potential locations, but it's not enough. Detailed set specific design is also needed, especially when we're dealing with renewable that varies hour by hour, day by day, seasonal by season. 
So the Muriel tool does that uh, planning capability. Uh, modeling green steel production actually presents unique challenge compared to the uh, conventional steel making rules because coal can be stored on site, just in a pile, and it enables 24 7 blast furnace operation. But wind and solar are variable, and the chemical reaction in the shaft furnace um, is happening in the really high temperature. And we need a constant inflow of hydrogen uh, to maintain that reaction, which means that kind of like a, uh, this kind of like a chemical reaction is inflexible, which means we need to uh, design a reliable renewable electricity supply and buffering system to uh, make sure that system, you know, uh, is working uh, continuously. So this comes to the design challenge. Uh, just to illustrate my point, the renewable variability at these two key locations you were mentioned, I just want to remind you, uh, we pinpoint these two locations and we found, you know, with co-location, with demand and supply, we just use hydrogen produced there. There's a lot of iron ore to do green steel production, then uh, try to avoid those difficult uh, hydrogen transportation issues. This makes perfect sense, but if we look at the uh, temporal variability of the renewable resources at these two locations, uh, we found, you know, as anywhere else, even though the renewable resource is abundant, but it presents uh, significant uh, variability as well. So if you look at the monthly plot showing the um, seasonal variability, you can see in the Cuba region, uh, we have a lot of wind um, in the in, in July, uh, June, but in the uh, in January or December, so you, you see uh, there's strong shortfall. Similarly, for uh, the solar resources in our peninsula, in the winter time, we see um, the solar you know, production reduced by one third. So we really need to have a system that is able to capture those uh, uh, seasonality. I think uh, Andrew has mentioned we have a large scale uh, seasonal uh, storage in South Carolina. This makes perfect sense, especially when we consider that scale. If you look at the hourly variability, sometimes we see wind blowing predominantly at night and solar at day. This Fantastic because we don't have we don't need to have a large battery system to buffer that variability. But sometimes we have a gloomy, less windy day. So you know what we need to do is you know have a, a, a battery storage. Uh, otherwise, we just oversize the capacity. So, but of course, during the uh, abandoned wind and solar days, we're gonna curtail a lot. But we need to uh, make the trade-off between uh, the cost, also the uh, uh, the cost also the benefits. So let's just do a, a simple optimization exercise because another uh, important factor to consider in this system uh, design is the cost. So uh, let's just um, look at hydrogen only because this is a key element for uh, green steel manufacturing. Imagine you have to produce a certain amount of hydrogen daily to meet your off-take agreement. If the electrolysis is very expensive, so you want to uh, have a smaller 24 seven plan to minimize the capital expenditure because you, you don't want to overspend. It's so expensive, you want to run it at a higher utilization rate. So what do you do is just to, uh, you're probably, probably gonna uh, oversize your renewable and accept the curtailment, and then maybe add a battery if it's not if it's uh, affordable. Conversely, if the electrolysis become cheaper and cheaper, you can install more capacity. So when renewable is low, you just reduce your energy some consumption, reduce your hydrogen production. But when the renewable, uh, you know, peaking abundant. With this larger electrolysis, you can produce extra hydrogen and to be stored on site. In that case, you need a large buffer tank. So this example actually just show you, uh, you know, when the energy modeler dealing with the cost, um, you know, we need to have a least cost production system that able to manage those uh, uh, cost considerations. This is only one factor, but in reality, uh, you know, uh, 
there are lots of factors to consider. Um, in the mural model, we consider operational constraints like ramping limits, minimum uh, downtime, minimum uptime, because some of the electrons need to run at a high temperature, you don't want to shut it down because you know, the inherent uh, invariability with this design. Also, um, you want to meet your offertake agreements, sometimes monthly, weekly, if you want to do a gas network injection, probably do it daily. Uh, but your system design is going to be constrained by those off-ticker agreements. So as you can see, there are lots of consider, um, factors to consider when we design this optimization model. This is why this model is so computationally expensive. We need a large computer and we need sufficient algorithm to solve it. Um, this is actual schematic of the uh, mural model in more detail. Um, you can see in that system, we have uh, wind and solar and different hours storage systems like two hours battery, uh, even pump hydro energy storage, if you can find a suitable site there. Uh, most importantly, we need to have electrolysis, different either pine or alkaline subject to different operational flexibilities and you need to have a, a balance of farm. Also, as I said, you will want to oversize your electrolysis, you need a, a buffer tank so that uh, you know uh, we got a constant inflow of hydrogen to make the reaction inside the uh, direct reduction furnace. And then once we get the green ion from the direct reduction furnace, we can uh, Turn, in, turn it into hot briquetted iron, which we need to compress it at high temperature. We can store it on site. We can also ship it to overseas. And if you want to produce steel, it just, uh, you can do the downstream processing on site as well with the integrated renewable supply system. In that case, you can produce green steel. So, um, you see this uh, complexity of this system design, but you also understand we need to have various buffering system to enable this uh, uh, a renewable green steel production system operating uh, reliably. This is very important. So in the uh, case study I'm going to show you is a system design exercise that we want to design a system that is able to produce 1000 tons of steel a day pretty much like a middle size or uh, still uh, a system. So uh, there's various uh, operational uh, constraints coming from the inherent in, uh, inflexibility of those chemical plant, but also uh, we have all the buffering systems. Um, uh, I'm going to show you three scenarios. One is uh, the, the entire system is powered by wind only because sometimes we do find a site that's only we can build wind. Um, also a solar PV only. Then the third case is a hybrid wind and solar. This is the optimized result hour by hour. I just pick a random day uh, in a future scenario in South, uh, in uh, WA actually in the, in the Puba region. So if you look at this hourly operation, optimized actually, it's optimized hourly operation uh, from Muriel, you can see, uh, this is the wind profile actually. You see <laughs> at, one, uh, at 1 p.m. pretty much we don't have much wind, but we do have wind in the early morning. In that case, um, we, we do need to curtail some of the, uh, um, some of the wind, especially during the, during the middle of the day when we got abandoned solar there because we can't have an even size of plant. We just have a smaller one, but we do need to curtail the renewable energy. This is not a bad thing. I think people sometimes say, okay, we're wasting energy, but no, actually, if you can do that cost comparison rather than have a larger uh, electrolyzer, then you know, it can save you money. So, which means over capacity plant is a strategy. We do have a lot of curtailment, but uh, we also have outside battery um, to provide the uh, energy uh, at nighttime when solar is not available, indicating the red uh, profiles. Um, so, we, do, we also need to charge the battery when there is abandoned solar. You'll see the negative, the, the dotted line there. So, this is when the battery is getting charged. The battery is quite small actually, uh, because 
you know, in that case, battery is very expensive. So uh, the, the mural find a smaller side in that case because we found over uh, well mixed wind and solar can increase the production rate um, pretty good. We don't need to have a big battery there, which is good news for that side. Yeah, and then this one shows the uh, hourly profile of how hydrogen being produced. Also, this is the hydrogen tank. So especially at nighttime, we do need to uh, get hydrogen out from the tank for uh, steel manufacturing, sorry, for, for lime manufacturing. Okay, because uh, this system actually is to uh, design a uh, constant um, power supply to make the uh, steel and iron production at constant rate. You see these uh, two lines here. So here is the cost, the underlying cost, the levelized cost uh, in, uh, in that uh, 2030 scenario at those two locations. You look, if you will see uh, for the wind only system, we do need to overcapacity wind quite a lot. But in that case, we also need to uh, have a large hydrogen tank there. We found actually if we can, for both locations, if we can optimize wind and solar and getting an optimal mix, we can really reduce the cost significantly. This is one of the strategy I think uh, when, when you need to remember when you design a system. Also that model in it was us to look at future scenarios. You know, what if um, we got uh, economical scale, the technology become cheaper, we can do the cost sensitivity analysis as well. Um, a more interesting um, case study, um, you know, we could explore different uh, deployment pathways. For example, you know, Japan maybe want to import ammonia from Australia, they want to do the downstream, downstream iron production of iron. So what is the underlying cost uh, difference between you know importing steel directly from Australia. So that model is a, enables us to do those kind of cost comparison. Okay, now I'll just briefly touch about uh, the forward model. So far I have explained why hour by hour matching is uh, necessary and is essential. The, mo uh, the mirror model is very powerful. However, it re requires significant computational time. To enable uh, open access, we want to um, balance accuracy and complexity. Um, the goal is to allow industry and investors to do high level estimate while still um, modeling this hour by hour operation, which is key. So in response, uh, we de developed a simpler, uh, simplified our uh, like forward model, but it still can give us the um, hourly operational uh, flexibility. So this makes the renewable energy system planning available to all stakeholders. Uh, users can rapidly assess different technology to look at different uh, configurations and different uh, uh, cost sensitivities. So uh, which makes perfect sense, especially at the uh, exploration stage. Just quickly go through uh, what the, the model does. Actually, as you can see, it's model the system hour by hour and telling you, you know, when you need to curtail, when the renewable electricity getting curtailed, um, you know, um, how the hydrogen is, uh, is getting out from the buffer tank. So this model rely on the user input about the, uh, the capacity you have for that system design. It's rather optimized, but uh, it's pretty much uh, applicable you know, to a potential investor, if, if they got a land, they got they want to build, let's say, 500 megawatts a wind farm. How much hydrogen they can produce? Um, you know, how much steel and iron they can produce at what cost? This model is uh, is pretty much tailored for that purpose. This is the cost assumptions. Although I'm saying it's a simplified model, but we have still got 100, more than 100 parameters there. So this is cost assumptions from the IEMO from different years. Um, also, this is the uh, uh, how the uh, input assumption for the hybrid model. So for this beta release, we only focus on this hybrid model because it's already commercially available. And in the future, we do uh, acknowledge there are other technologies available. So hopefully, uh, 
with your uh, feedback, we can refine this model in the future um, and now pass it to, uh, to Marcus to, uh, to do the live demo. Thanks. Thank you, Cheng. So that gives you a high level overview of um, the projects that we've been working on over the years and, and a more in-depth um, overview of the, the, um, the technical work that we've been developing behind this green steel model. Um, I might pause to see if there were a couple of questions before I do dive into the live demo. One online. One online. Mm -hmm. The Monash submission to the NHS um, session strategy um, is public, and so if there is a link to it. So is the uh, is the. So the answer is uh, yes, we can make it publicly available, but no, there's no link to it. But we'll uh, try and make it available through the Melbourne Energy Institute. So, and so send us an email. That's how it works. <laughs> Just repeat the question. Okay, yeah. Um, Carol asked me uh, in in a slide. I, sh I compare different pathways for uh, steel making. Like uh, Japan might want to import ammonia or uh, liquid hydrogen to do their downstream processing. I go yeah. I went that slide pretty quickly because I want to show the model capability rather than the inside. If you want to look at the inside, you can uh, have the papers. But actually, the one of the key insights for that is ammonia might not be that good option because you want to uh, ammonia can save your cost for shipping. But once you get the ammonia for, for steel, you need to convert the ammonia into hydrogen, which is worth 30% of the energy. And why then you see the cost is actually it's higher than liquid hydrogen. But this is all based on the adoption we found publicly available information. But maybe technology becomes better. Um, it's only a thought experiment, but uh, we do want to highlight the, those conversion losses. Uh, I guess one other thing, I said, and we're not saying that ammonia is not a, a bad choice. It's just yeah, that no, ammonia for steel ammonia making, for yeah, for the uh, ammonia for hydrogen in steel making might not be the best yeah, option. Because yeah, exactly. I know that there's already some experimental work looking at ammonia, direct use of ammonia in steel making. For iron, iron too. Um, yeah, but um, and, and just to answer your question is, what sort of insights can we get, gain from this? Well, we're, we're still exploring <laughs> as part of it. Um, and uh, But we're definitely really interested in sort of exploring what the optimal pathways are for us to engage with our trade partners, um, especially given things like with some of the direct reduced iron pathways, yeah. we can take advantage of existing facilities in other countries. And so you don't have to pay those capex expenses and those sorts exactly. of things. So there's a question in the short term versus long term, and there's a whole bunch of other things we can investigate. Yes. Okay, so lots of people speak about green steel, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. they have to talk. So I'm with the Lancaster Planning Environment and Geological Survey, and one of our current sort of considerations is the Nullarbor Plain, Gifta Basin, along the Trans Australian Railway Fund. What would the heft map look like if we're modelling some scenario that's saying, let's put a, an integrated solar wind facility on the Nullarbor Plain, mm -hmm. with an interconnect between Kalgoorlie and South Australia? Has optimal advantages for supplying Eastern Australian grid? Does, so it, does, the, the, does the interconnect actually exist already, or is it proposed? Ah, okay. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, just to repeat that question, can we use the heft? Can we use the heft tool to model future scenarios in which we might build um, pan Australian um, transmission lines or new transmission lines? Um, and yes, the answer is we can't use the online tool for it. Um, but one of the things we can do with that um, heft blue cap source code is basically we've got some underlying data sets that are basically transmission line distances that are in there so we can run it through those sorts of scenarios and look at those sorts of things too um, and then if you want to go into more detail and sort of say okay well maybe we want to collect our solar from a bunch of different places rather than just one location well then uh, then you can start looking at things with muriel too um, some of these details are not things we can do straight out of the box we have to do some coding in the back end but come and have a chat and yeah so you can look at
Chang don't hide kind of so um so we've done that in a couple of ways i think in the main sort of heft model we don't do that directly but there are um, layers that you can put over the top to look at excluded regions and sensitive regions and those sorts of things um we have done an analysis in the past where we have um, assumed that you have to route around particular areas and those sorts of things the difficulty is we can't really predict what the end users definitions of sensitive versus not sensitive are so we're just leaving it out we're saying that that that's out there again um, we can help you with specific details around that. I, I guess a similar kind of question so you might have uh a large requirement for capacity mm -hmm. or your raw capacity. Um, where where that's located will drive you know, what the capacity factor is, how long your transmission lines are, mm -hmm. and therefore what optimal mix is. Yep. How long are you, how far away are you allowing it to do it? With the main heft tool, we're basically assuming it's a each point, because again it's a sort of preliminary analysis. With something like Mural, you could go to more extents where you're sort of deciding where it is. I mean, potentially you can compare one, uh, an electric arc furnace that's run in Japan and the hydrogen and everything else that's done in Australia because you're just looking at two different uh, power series at different locations, basically, and you're mixing those up. Um, again, a lot of the functionality that we'd like to be able to expose to people, as you've sort of seen, everyone has slightly different ideas about what they'd like to do with the tool, and that's great. We can't do all of them, but we can help you do some of those things too. So, uh, so I have the, uh, I guess the, the great job to to talk about how we go from the technical to being able to try and uh, make that accessible through some of our online tools. I also have the terrifying job of attempting to do a live demonstration. So I'm hoping it all goes really well. <laughs> um, and trying to make sure that we land on time for lunch. So. First of all, before I get into the tool, I want some really high level uh, overview. Uh, we've talked a lot about our economic fairways approach in some of our projects and previous tools, but, but what is the economic fairways mapper? You know, it, it's really designed to provide um, very rapid, high level um, maps, and, you know, spatial analysis of the economic potential for resource development projects across Australia. It fits into Geoscience Australia's, I guess, philosophy of providing pre-competitive information or that is, you know, providing early access to information so that we can have better informed decision making around trying to identify, you know, Australia's natural advantages and our strategic priorities. As it's already been mentioned a couple of times, it's it's really designed around helping inform the um, decision makers whether they are in industry, whether they're um, in you know, finance, uh, government, or even communities to understand their potential in their backyard. Uh, as Sihan mentioned this morning, we were very fortunate last week to be awarded a Eureka Prize on the back of this um, project work. And I, I, I particularly raise this here just to flag that one of the aspects behind that uh, prize was our ability to demonstrate impact. And in particular, uh, for the hydrogen industry and also, also to the minerals industry. So we come at this sort of project and this approach with some confidence that we know that it, that, that it works, that it has worked, um, that it has been able to help uh, industry to screen potential projects and to identify those um, strategically important priority areas. If you'd like to find out more about the project, we've got a, a project um, activity page which you can get to through through the uh, QR code or, or from the link at the top. Um, Stuart mentioned we release all of all of the software that's written uh, in in Python and available through our um, GitHub um, repository. Uh, the codes I'm showing today aren't quite there yet, but the previous hydrogen and, and minerals work is. Uh, the general economic fairways mapper is available on GA's um, portal. And there's also a, a dedicated link to the hydrogen heft tool. Um, great acronym. We're currently struggling with one for the green steel. So open to any ideas. So that's kind of, you know, a high level overview of, of the approach and, and where to find information. But how does it actually work? Um, this is a little schematic we, we did up for the, uh, the minerals version of the tool. Uh, it highlights how economic 
the economic fairways mapper brings together large scale data sets and integrates them through the lens of resource development economics. Uh, so if we were to extend this particular project um, to look at say the opportunities around magnet magnetite, um, because we can see how you know, in the future that might become more important, um, you know, potentially the, the push towards magnetite opens up you know, new mineral systems rather than the, the production from banded iron formations. But at the same time, these mineral systems you know, typically are a bit smaller. Maybe they, their, their capital expenditure is too large. Well, this sort of tool allows you to bring together at a high level all of these different factors to actually test some of these rather than just to make assumptions. Um, I've had a, a quick go at trying to put together a similar schematic for our approach to the, the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper. Um, now, as we've mentioned, we're at the early stages of, of this sort of project. And while there's a, a bunch of stuff that we, we could do, um, we can't necessarily do everything. So in thinking about the main levers for determining um, the, the opportunities and challenges for green steel, we've really focused in on what we think, I guess, is the primary lever, which is your, your access to cheap renewable energy and trying to understand how that interacts with a much more complicated, um, complex um, production uh, you know, cycle with the interaction between the production of hydrogen, iron making and steel making. Um, and as we've mentioned a couple of times, you know, I guess there's a lot that we could do, but really at the heart of, of this approach is taking opportunities like this to, to talk to everyone, to talk to the community and find out, you know, how, uh, you, what your priorities are, what the questions you're asking. So now um, I can show up the uh, beta version of the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper. The first thing that I'd like to do is to give you, a, I guess, a, a quick orientation of the, the portal structure that it sits in, um, just to help out. So there's a, you can access this through the smart devices. There's the QR code uh, and also um, a uh, URL there. That's um, portal.ga.gov.au slash persona slash green steel. So. I'll, I'll flash that up a couple of times, but um, just so you can have a copy and let's uh, test. Let's take a leap of faith and I had if this works. So this is the, uh, the current landing page for the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper. It's designed around Geoscience Australia's portal. Uh, and the way you can navigate that is through this um, ribbon across the top of the portal. So first of all, that we've got an about section on the left again, some high level information, um, some links to some of the data that's supporting um, our economic fairways mapper and to some of our publications related to the green steel model. Uh, the next tab across the, uh, the ribbon is the layers. So this is where you can interact with uh, some of Geoscience Australia's other um, data so, um, services and layers. So at the moment, we've got an active layer um, showing um, minerals processing plants around Australia. So I can identify that by clicking on these uh, three dots and just highlighting the active layers. We can uh, apply some filters to this in sort of information. So if I scroll down, we can look at the commodities. We can uh, turn them all off and look for iron. <coughs> and we can apply that filter. And so that brings up a list of the, uh, the different iron processing facilities uh, around Australia. And if you wanted more information on those, uh, you can click on them to bring up some of the metadata around what those are, including uh, potential links to where that information has come from. So I'll, I'll just turn off those layers by removing them. Uh, the other one I wanted to flag on the left side of the ribbon is the data and publications. So I've seen a few comments pop up particularly uh, on the online chat around where we can access some of these resources. So this gives you a, um, a very quick way to link to the publications that have been coming out of the, the Economic Fairways team uh, and particularly some of these uh, green steel um, papers and to links to the original blue cap um, paper and codes. Um, and then there's also links to other uh, useful information services like Australia's identified mineral resources and this would take you straight through to the uh, this section on iron ore. And then finally, on the right-hand side of the ribbon, if you click on tools, 
uh, within the within this green steel economics fairways mapper that will automatically open up this beta version of the green steel tool um, if you're using the the uh, ga's more generic portal uh, then you'll have to navigate through the, the different tool options that are available and, and find the economic fairways mapper when you do open up the economic fairways mapper you see these uh, red polygons pop up across australia these are the, the sort of identify the valid regions where you can currently run the code um, this is partly because as as uh, Chang talked about uh, in the talk previous, there's a lot of information that sits behind this. Um, we're, we're harvesting hour by hour renewable energy capacity um, factor maps um, for a year across across these parts of Australia. Uh, and so we, we couldn't uh, do everything uh, immediately. So we had to prioritize the areas we're going to look at. So in these areas, we've got all of that information pre-canned, ready to be analyzed. I'll momentarily back into my slideshow. To say why why those regions, it comes back to this sort of analysis um, that's been shown a couple of times. So it's really taking those um, those colored polygons, identifying the areas where we think we have the best um, uh, conditions for producing green hydrogen, and then also using those locations where we know we've got um, resources of um, magnetite and hematite, um, putting a little buffer around these regions and then uh, collecting all of the data for those areas. So the next the next step is the uh, the, the live demonstration and hands-on session. Um, and just before we get into that, I, I did want to again sort of have this primer and, uh, and Stuart's already mentioned it, but as you as you're looking at the tool and, and interacting with the tool, I would like you to be you know thinking about these sorts of questions, you know, when when we're when you're looking at the opportunities and the challenges around the production of green steel in Australia, you know, what what are the specific questions that you're asking, and how could pre-competitive information analysis and geoscience help? Um, what what sort of aspects to this tool do you think are missing? You know, I've I've put up a list there, and, and as we've said, we could work on this for years, and then produce a, a comprehensive tool set. But if it misses the mark, then what's the point? So it's really important. That we have this opportunity to take your feedback um, around the uh, around your priorities. What are the bottlenecks to production? You know, what information does Australia need to make sure that these sorts of tools are delivering real utility and capability? So now's the chance where we all get to to jump onto the tool and, and have a go. Um, I'm going to go through a series of different, I suppose, ex examples about how we might use this tool. Um, ignore the the times that I've put on against these we'll have to be a little bit agile about how we we do this but i would be keen to hear your your uh, questions as, as we go along so first of all i'm going to jump into the uh, into the tool i guess starting at the very highest levels you know asking you know what is the cost to produce green steel uh, and how does that vary across australia as, as we go through the user interface we'll be sticking to all of the default inputs for for this scenario but it gives us a chance to talk through what those are and we'll be running this at the regional scale. It'll give us some, I guess, high level maps um, before we step into some of the more detailed graphs that, uh, that Chang was showing in his presentation. So the idea behind these, these broader scale high level maps is that it gives you a chance to, to, I guess, work out your strategic priorities, identify areas where you wanna drill down for more detailed analysis or to follow on for you know, different studies and, and um, different uh, capabilities. And I'm hoping that, first of all, this, this example gives everyone an, an overview of the tool. Um, I'm hoping that by the end of today, you feel you know, comfortable and confident in being able to use the tool and understand um, how its construction, including the inputs, outputs, and, and assumptions. So let's end the presentation and jump back in. There we go. So as I mentioned, there are, there are two sort of different ways to, to run the tool, first of all. You can run at a point mode, which will give you access to those detailed graphs that Chang was showing in terms of the hour by hour performance of the different parts of the, the steel production um, process. But for this first one, we're gonna select an area to enable us to do large scale mapping. Um, you can draw your um, extent of interest on the map, um, but if you click on manual, it automatically brings up the, the bounding box for Australia, which will allow us to get a good um, high-level overview. Now, this um, 
this first analysis box is, I guess, a, a bit of a, a hangover from our previous economic fairways models, where we've got different ways of running the tool, looking at sensitivity analysis, uncertainty analysis, you know, break-even costs. Uh, at the moment, early stages, so we've just got the basic run setting. So for now, you can pass over that, but it does, does sort of point to different things we could do in the future. Beneath that, our user interface is divided into um, four sort of constituent components. There's the aspects of the steel plant, aspects of the hydrogen plant, the renewable energy um, plants, and then some economic questions as well. Within the steel plant, you can choose whether you want to um, undertake a model that's looking at the production of steel, or you can choose to select hot briquette iron, HBI, which will essentially sort of isolate that, that steel plant and, and stop there. So we can, to Zihan's question, run models that um, focus particularly on iron on the production of green iron and how that might fit into the value chain. Um, for the first example, I'll, I'll stick to steel. You can play with settings around the life of the plant, um, the efficiency at which the ore is converted to steel, and the, uh, you know, the, the capital expenditure, the, essentially the cost of putting this technology uh, into place. We've tried to, where possible, set these to um, uh, estimates of relatively current values, say you know, 2025, given that nothing's in production and nothing exists at the moment, um, based on published literature, uh, and then uh, allowed a, a variance of around plus or minus 20%. So you know, if you've got um, different assumptions you'd like to make, you can put those in. Uh, if you want to look at future forecasts when technology is cheaper, um, you can also you know, adjust these sorts of sliders to look at that. Within the hydrogen plant, Again, um, there's a choice around technology. At, the, at this stage, we've only got the, the PEM electrolysis, the, the proton exchange membranes. Um, we do recognize there are, you know, there's also alkaline electrolysis. Um, we've decided to focus on PEM at this stage due to its greater flexibility and being able to handle the um, renewable energy inputs um, that sort of Chang flagged in his talk. You can adjust the capacity of, of the electrolysis plant um, and again, reflecting on the talks from earlier this morning, uh, the projections for Australia in 2025 is a total electrolysis capacity of 35 megawatts. So um, have a look at that as we're moving through these examples and keep that in mind. And then the same sort of pattern beneath that, we have the capital expenditure, so the cost of technology, uh, as well as the cost of hydrogen storage. Then you have the choice of renewable energy sources. Uh, it defaults to a hybrid of wind and solar, but you can choose one or the other if you'd like. Uh, same sort of pattern, you can put in the capacity, yeah, overall capacity that you'd like for these different plants. Um, then we have the, the capex values and the costs of deploying the technology. And then beneath these, we have a similar pattern, but in this case for the battery electricity storage system or BESS. Uh, you can adjust the battery capacity, uh, the length of storage hours for the battery and its capex as well. So again, we'll stick to the defaults for now. And finally, we have the uh, a couple of economic uh, questions. So at this stage, we're modeling um, based on just receiving uh, iron ore. And we're assuming um, uh, pellets at 67% um, iron content. So you can adjust the price um, that you're willing to assume for being able to source that. So at the moment, this is you know, considerably higher than the current price for, for iron ore, but that's because that's based on you know, direct shipping or uh, this would require the extra benefic beneficiation and the extra costs in, associated with that. And then there's also the economic discount rate. So your willingness to discount future um, you know, uh, revenue or um, liabilities. So we'll run with all of the, the default assumptions. So we're running this at the national scale. Uh, I think uh, there's about 8.2 gigabytes of renewable energy data sitting at the back end that we're sort of interrogating. So it takes about a minute to run these um, big scale maps to try and make the problem tractable when we are running at this sort of scale. We, we subsample the grid um, across Australia. So you'll get, I guess, a, a slightly blurrier picture, but it, 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 it does remarkably well at, um, at mapping out the first order controls. If you want to um, dive into a little bit more granularity, you can um, select a smaller uh, study extent and that will have a, a finer grid um, that shows up. So we'll just give that a moment to load. We're doing some uh, user testing with our portal developers uh, and they, they assure me that we should be able to 
handle up to, to 60 concurrent um, uh, versions of this being thrown at it at the same time. So it should be more than enough. Um, and I think you know, a credit to our, our web portal developers who actually give us the confidence to present these sorts of results live. That's uh, really, <laughs> thank you, Stuart. <laughs> uh, I will sleep easy tonight. That's, that's a, a weight off my chest. Um, so there's a range of different uh, map figures that you get from running it uh, at this, um, this version of the tool. The first off is the, the landing page is the levelized cost of steel. That's probably the, the thing that most people are asking when they're, they're interacting with this tool. And you can see that varying, again, based on the input assumptions that we've used, and that is very important, but varying across Australia from uh, you know, about 750 to 960 Australian dollars a ton. Um, if you want to uh, check a certain location, there's a query point button down here. So we could look at um, somewhere in the Pilbara. And it'll take a moment. It gives us the lat long that we clicked and the specific value of you know, about 820 Australian dollars per ton. We also then break this down into some of those constituent source components. So we've got the, the cost associated with the renewable energy um, plants. And you can see how much you know, those are contributing to the overall levelized cost. Uh, there's the costs associated with the, the non-energy hydrogen costs. So that's really capturing the, the electrolysis, um, the hydrogen storage, the balance of plant, but not the renewable energy because that's already in the energy costs. Um, and you can also look at the uh, steel making costs. Now you'll see that in this, this for this model, these aren't varying uh, across the country, um, but they do rely on the input assumptions that you've put in. So that might change between different modeling runs, but you know, these are capturing things like um, the cost of the iron ore, um, you know, the, the alloys and graphite, the, the labor costs as well that are put in into this one. So things that aren't really uh, influenced by the, the change in renewable energy capacity. Uh, we had a comment earlier about um, uh, some GA, I guess, producing exciting maps. So this is probably my entry for one of the most avant-garde or experimental visualizations. Um, just to, to test it out, um, I took some functionality that we'd already developed to plot up uh, a ternary map that essentially looks at the overall weighting of those different um, contributions to the, the um, levelized cost of steel. So where, where those components, the energy, hydrogen, and steel making are relatively equal, uh, then we get this map producing relatively white pixels. Uh, in areas where the levelized cost is relatively low for this particular um, modeling assumptions, we do see that the steel start, or the steel making costs tend to dominate and you end up with these more ready orange hues. So I don't know if that uh, if that is useful, but I thought it would be uh, interesting to show that sort of visualization to compare the overall contribution of the different components. So the, as, as I mentioned, the intent of this you know, large scale mapping is to allow us to be able to drill down into uh, finer areas and use, um, use that to, to do follow up studies. So I'll just uh, quickly do, a, a, I guess, a smaller model based around uh, Queensland. Run the, the same assessment and you'll see that, um, you know, the, it's done on much more uh, granular level. Um, so you can you can use that to then decide where you want to follow up to delve into the point tool uh, and look at the more um, complex hour by hour system performance plots. So hopefully give that a moment. There we are. So we can see that uh, for this particular model, we're getting a point uh, inland from Mackay. Um, now, Alibar's further down here now. Uh, that you know, seems to be on the order of 800 Australian dollars per ton. So I'll, I'll uh, just bring up the um, next, uh, not that one, next case study question, which will allow us to dive into the uh, into the point tool in more detail. So I've, uh, I've, I've done this high level analysis. I found a really nice spot to put a steel plant. It's the Fraser Suites in Perth. So 
the coordinates are there. Um, make a note of that, but I can, I've, I've got them in my pocket so I can share it as we're doing a live demo. And the idea is we want to use the, you know, the current, essentially the current um, technology costs. So we're not going to vary the, the CapEx costs, um, but I would like to you know, have a little competition um, just to give everyone a chance to, to think about how the, the tool is working to see who can come up with the lowest levelized cost of, of steel for producing steel within the Fraser Suites. Um, uh, we need to try and hit a, a production target of about 31,000 tons of steel per day, which matches Chang's example of 1,000, sorry, 31,000 tons of steel in January, which matches 1,000 tons per day. Um, I think you know this will give you a bit of a deeper understanding of the, the dynamics of the tool. Um, you'll have to, I suppose, go through a, a slight manual optimization of the project configurement configuration. Uh, things to look at are the hourly system, um, the hourly you know, renewable energy production. See how you can balance um, the solar and the wind based on the graphs that you're getting for this location. And then consider how that maps into a hydrogen production within the electrolysis system. Uh, Chang kind of gave the answer away earlier, but I think this will give you a chance to, to actually see it in, in operation. But what when electrolysis is, is is expensive, how do you actually balance the the size of the renewable energy plants in order to lower the levelized cost? So the easiest way well, to step into this, again, I'll go back to portal, well, is to do a manual entry of a point location, coordinates being. 115.877 and minus 31.961. And we'll see, we'll just turn off those uh, layers as well. So we can zoom right in. So here we are in Perth. I'm not sure if it is the reason, but something I realized as I was putting this uh, this example together is this might be the uh, the reason why it's called the Swan River. It's, it certainly does look like one from a satellite. Um, so the easiest way in, into this problem is, I guess, first of all, if you, if you have any intuition about how you would size the different components and feel free to, to adjust the uh, the capacity of the different plants. Um, but perhaps uh, if not just run an assessment the point the point example runs much faster because we're not running it over a huge number of locations across australia so this does tend to pop up in just a, a few seconds and the visualization we get out of that again we start off on a landing page that looks at a stacked histogram of the levelized cost of steel you get your total value at the top in this case using the default settings that's coming in at 860 dollars uh, but you can also hover the mouse over those different components to see, you know, in this case, we're having um, hydrogen storage costs in, in you know, hydrogen tanks. They're contributing $126 to that overall mm -hmm. figure. And similarly, we can see the electrolysis. Um, and I've tried to uh, color code those based on that broader groupings of the different plants. So the greens are our renewable energy components. The blue is the hydrogen storage and electrolysis. And um, going into the red is the, the cost of iron ore, the steel alloys and graphite, um, the shaft and electric furnace, and then in purple is the labor. Now we can dive into the hourly system performance. Um, these charts do get a touch busy, but we've got, if you scroll down, there's an enlarge button, which will take it to full screen and allow you to see a little bit more detail, work out what's going on. Um, if you want to understand the values at a particular place, you can hover your cursor over and that will give you the, um, the performance of that particular component at that time. Uh, this, it starts off, well, it plots one month at a time. So this is January. 
if you want to look at a different month, you can click on the month below the chart and it will adjust. So as I said, a good way into this problem uh, for those that are attempting to, to find the best deal uh, is to look at the, the solar generation and the wind generation, compare and contrast how much energy you're actually getting out of that capacity for those different plants, um, get them to some sort of, some sort of balance, uh, and then adjust the electrolysis, which is your hydrogen production. And you can see that you know at certain times of the uh, certain times of the day, the renewable energy is uh, essentially saturating our our uh, electrolysis system, so the, the um, hydrogen production tops out. In this case, at a value of uh, just under three tons an hour. And then you can also see how much energy is being curtailed, again, month on month uh, over the course of the year. All of this information is based on the re actual renewable energy figures for this location in 2019. Um, we've sourced this from the renewable, Renewables Ninja um, service, uh, which is uh, an online service that provides this sort of renewable uh, energy information. And uh, as I mentioned, we um, pre canned it for all of those areas within the valid region. Well, I'll have to I'll have to keep moving. But um, has anyone got a levelized cost of steel for the Fraser Suites that they think is competitive? Otherwise, I'll uh, I'll put in the um, eight hundred. That's I think that's pretty decent. Um, we t we could, did get uh, Chang to run the the fully optimized Muriel, Muriel model at this location, and it's, I think it's going to give us a very similar similar figure. So in this you case, the key component is the uh, the the key component is the cost. Yeah. I think for not the dollars so we've got an electrolysis capacity of 343 megawatts. Um, so again, significantly higher than projections for Australia in 2025 currently. Um, a solar capacity of 280. I can bring that down. Again, with these sliders, sometimes it's hard to get the value you want. Once you've adjusted it, you can actually use your arrows on the keyboard to, to get it somewhere precise if you need. A wind capacity of 430. That'll do. And a battery capacity of 105. So again, we'll give that just a couple of seconds and we should see a levelized cost of you know, just over $800 a ton. And you can see, um, again, the different components that have gone into making that estimate. And if you've been running multiple of these um, scenarios, they're stored in the, in the cache um, on your browser. So you can go back to your first result and compare and contrast um, what you're seeing and how that's changed the different components and how they're contributing to that levelized cost. All right, we'll get through just a couple more examples. So in example three, I wanted to, to tie back to some of the uh, the geoscience that Andrew was presenting earlier today in terms of salt storage across Australia. So I want to see if we can use this tool to identify, you know, are there areas that would benefit from additional research to identify potential salt storage targets? So in order to do this, we'll, we'll do a regional map. We'll focus on uh, the product being, you know, green iron, um, because that's the, the key component of the uh, um, the production of hydrogen being fed into the uh, the direct reduction, so we can get rid of the steel making for now. Um, and in particular, we can focus on a, a single renewable energy source. You know, pick either wind or solar, um, whatever you, you think would be most interesting. And look at how, once we get those maps, look at how the 
uh, the, um, the costs of the hydrogen component change regionally. Um, so I'll bring up mine to work through it at the same time. I'll just clear these results and return to the large scale map. Something that you can do for this particular example is to look at how um, you can interact this tool with, again, the, the other layers that Geoscience Australia makes available through this portal. Um, so in this case, if we're looking for salts, we can look for uh, halite. I'll do a search there and we've picked up um, this layer, known thick underground halite deposits. So this is, it's got a little um, description, locations of known thick halite or salt deposits that are greater than 100 meters thick with the potential for scale, a large scale hydrogen storage. So we can add those to our map, see where, we, where we've already got um, some potential um, hydrogen storage targets. And so you can look at, I guess, the, the areas that we've identified as being the, the priority regions where you can run this tool and you can compare and contrast that to the areas where, um, where we know we've got uh, potential storage targets. So I'll just set up the, uh, this particular run, focusing on the production of green iron by changing the product to hot briquette iron. And I'll just double check my notes, a single energy source. So I'll, uh, I'll look at solar. Otherwise, uh, for now, I'll leave the, um, the different settings on their default values. So this is a 500 megawatt um, solar plant uh, feeding a 200 megawatt electrolysis plant. And I will remember to select a, an area extent. So this will take a, a minute um, to run this again at the national scale. So something to think about in this scenario is, you know, the role that hydrogen storage is playing um, in the, uh, the levelized cost of steel. So what hydrogen storage, even though you know, we're, we're not using hydrogen as an energy source, you know, we're using it to do chemical work through the reduction of, of iron oxides, uh, it still allows us to store, I guess, a, a large volume of work. And it, it's a much larger volume than we can potentially store in, in the battery system, which buffers you know, changes in renewable energy over the order of hours. Whereas the hydrogen storage really allows us to, to buffer this system for seasonal variations. So what we're going to um, see uh, mapped through the changes in, in hydrogen costs for this is how those seasonal variations increase the costs of hydrogen storage. Uh, and where those costs are high, um, and I'll just bring up that cost of hydrogen storage map, uh, they are, those are the areas, I suppose, that are, are, could maximally benefit from the, um, you know, further research to identify proximal salt storage targets. Um, I think we saw from Andrew's talk that there's a, there's a certain order of magnitude to the scale of, of hydrogen that's needed for green steel that, you know, salt storage is probably going to be an important nevertheless. Um, but uh, I think the, the figures I've seen is that the, the salt storage is on the order of 10 to 15% cheaper than storage in, in physical, you know, above ground tanks. So we can see that in this ex particular example, which is based on uh, wind, that you know we've got higher seasonal variation in the wind in southern Australia, which kind of makes sense given the uh, uh, the location down, getting in towards the uh, you know roaring forties and those cold fronts that come through. Solar, solar. Oh, I did solar dome. Oh, yeah, solar. there we go. Well, it's probably also related to that climate uh, band anyway, given the um, the fronts that come through and cloud cover. Um, so. Again, we can see that the, the change in the cost of hydrogen storage and this model, you know, currently in the model, we're assuming tank storage um, because you know, that's the, what we've got examples to point to in order to calibrate the cost functions. Um, you can see the costs uh, down here in, in Southern Australia are on the order of uh, $460 a ton. Um, and, you know, we do have potential uh, uh, storage targets that are you know, being identified in these regions. There's, is it the, the Polder Basin? that sort of runs um, uh, from onshore to offshore uh, somewhere along this coast. Um, 
potentially you know quite thick salt deposits. So if you're saving you know 10 to 15 percent on the storage costs, there's an opportunity there to bring those levelized costs down. In this case, again, you know it's based on the assumptions that we've put in, but to potentially bring the costs down, um, you know, 40 to 60 dollars. Uh, so you can begin to see how you know, a salt target there for a, a solar production um, is quite different. You know, has a, a different benefit uh, in terms of bringing those costs down to a, a salt storage target where the hydrogen storage costs are only $190, where you might be looking at you know, uh, 20 to 25, 20 to $30 reduction in the uh, levelized cost. And I'll finish with one final example. In this case, looking at how we can use this tool to interact with the uh, the hydrogen economic fairways tool that's been flagged a couple of times, and I guess is is much more sophisticated in the um, in the components that have been built into that tool. So in this case, uh, looking from a uh, the perspective of someone who wants to produce hydrogen, um, so rather than the fully integrated system, and you know what's the what's the break-even cost of supply based on the order of magnitude of hydrogen production that we're seeing in the models that we're running. So before I jump into the HEF tool, we can, um, we can quickly run an example point to find the order of magnitude for our hydrogen production. I'll Clear that point and pick an example in Victoria in this this time. Again, I won't change too many of the levers just to to keep things speedy. Run a point tool. We'll we'll look at the um, hourly system performance. I'll enlarge that so we can see and look at the hydrogen offtake. Now, as as Chang already raised in his talk, uh, the the reduction the shot the direct reduction in the shaft furnace is operating at high temperature. So we're trying to avoid you know, varying that production too much. So you do see a, a, you know, a flat line, a relatively constant production in the hydrogen offtake in the uh, in the green steel economic fairways mapper. Uh, and that maps that uh, that concept that you know this, this is what we expect based on the, uh, the performances that we want in the system. So for this example, we are producing uh, you know, about one and a half tons of hydrogen um, per hour that's being fed into the uh, the shaft furnace. So I'll jump across, use the link to the heft hydrogen economic fairways mapper. <clears throat> Oops, ah. quickly not create a new email account. So again, this has its own own little portal landing page um, with its own um, you know, bespoke set of uh, data layers and publications that you can refer to. It's got more video tutorials on how to use the tool. Um, but I'll just do a quick example. Um, select Australia. I'll find the uh, um, hydrogen production. So in this case, it's looking at tons of hydrogen per day. So we had, what was it, a 1.5 1, 1. tons. Um, let me check again. <laughs> 70. Yeah, tons. Sorry? This is 1.5 tons per hour. So it's about uh, whatever it is, you know, 30. 40 tons a day. We can go to the um, hydrogen economic fairways tools. Oh, the, that's what I almost forgot. In this case, we've got more advanced ways of running the tool, so we can look at the break even price. Change the hydrogen produced to, let's say, 40, 40 tons a day. Or thereabouts, and run the tool. Now, in this case, we've selected the endpoint as being the um, the nearest suitable port. So this would be an example that looks at the production of hydrogen 
to get it to port and ship to you know international operations of this scale. Um, this this tool runs much faster. It's not it's not drawing on the same volume of information. Um, we've got um, sort of annualized renewable energy capacity maps that are supporting the hydrogen tool. Um, and you can see in this case, uh, as I said, to get hydrogen at this volume to port, uh, the hydrogen producer would have a break-even price of between um, $4.30 to, to $6.80. You can compare and contrast that if we refine that and just change that endpoint to a, um, you know, the, the co-location. If you're producing hydrogen on site, you're avoiding all of those transportation costs, um, then your costs will come down. And we'll quickly show you that example. Mark, if you might also then at this point out the customizable operations um, you have the cost of the hydrogen, which is quite Yeah, yeah. Once it runs. So you can see um, that this one is less um, less dependent on the, the physical infrastructure, you know, the, the road transportation distances to get it to market. Um, and in this case, the uh, um, yeah, our break-even price from uh, just under four dollars to five dollars. And again, the same sorts of query points. In this case, you can download some of these maps as geotips, or um, you can download the uh, a CSV of all of your modeling assumptions. And the the heft tool also has similar uh, similar sliders around the um, you know the balance that you'd like between the renewable energies if you're running a hybrid renewable energy um, plant. Um, there's a bit more around the, the different technologies that have been used. Uh, and forecasting their, their cost reductions in, into the future. So it starts, it defaults to uh, estimates from 2021, but you also have uh, 2030 or 2050. Um, you can change between alkaline, electrolysis, or PEM. Uh, and again, there's a range of different, um, different estimates. And if you hover your cursor over it, you get a little explanation there of where that estimate has come from. Um, or if you, if you really, you know, again, if, if you've got inside information around, you know, a particular business has their um, their assumptions for what technology costs, you can also then um, click the customize the cost functions and you've got a, a lot more freedom to, to change these to figures that you think are, are reasonable. Um, assumptions around the, the source of the water and similar things around the plant life, the, the discount rate. Um, potentially currency conversions. Uh, so it's a little bit more sophisticated. It shows where we've gone to with some of these tools in the past, um, but also I, I think it shows how the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper can sort of be used in, in conjunction with some of these other tools to ask and pose interesting questions. So I think that's where we're gonna have to leave it now in order to, to get to lunch, um, but I'm certainly happy to, to take any questions or to talk over lunch and um, hear your, your feedback. Uh, yeah, certainly. And um, so we've for the for the Green Steel Economic Fa Fairways Mapper, um, most of this is based on a publication that we've already already released. So that's available through this data and publications. Um, and this is the Green Steel synergies between the iron. Australian iron ore industry and the production of green hydrogen. So all of our default settings and um, yeah, some of the assumptions that are perhaps you know behind behind the hood that you can't adjust, those will be detailed there. Yeah. Oh yeah, we'd, we'd certainly look to to doing that if if, if you've got um, if you've got particular preferences. I think one of the things we try and balance is to you know, to make the tools accessible and usable, we need to give you know, certain guidance as to what's what's reasonable. And it's always a bit of a balancing act between enabling someone to jump on, pick something silly, and then say, look at what GA's tool is saying. Um, but certainly if these, are, if these are valid questions that are being asked, I think it's reasonable to try and create capacity to answer them.
also a big challenge with the industry, like uh, manual employees, they don't want to keep the processes in steel. They will really help us entry into steel. <laughs> We are actually looking forward to further development model to reflect more on different technology, different feed grade, and different consumer material scenario. We actually, if you're industry happy to do more sophisticated detail, contact us. <laughs> we had a big debate about whether or not we should push to get the transportation cost in, for example, and I was just nervous about breaking everything the week before we had it run out, so we, we held off on that one. So that's that's my fault. That's you can blame me. Yeah. And I would highly suggest that you write down your suggestions, things we can improve on, because this is a beta version. We're looking for direct feedback from you guys. Yeah, bro. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're and particularly with some of our other tools, we're, we're certainly looking at that sort of um, capability, uh, the things that are actively being developed. Um, a few technical challenges that we found along the way, otherwise we probably would have already done that. Um, but yeah, no, certainly, ag again, given given the connection between you know, how important all of these assumptions are to the results, it's really important that when people actually take those away, that they're tied together, because um, otherwise you lose all context. Um, in the, we have that type of analysis in the mineral economic fairways tool. The, the difficulty with heft, and I guess it also might be a bit of a challenge with um, the green steel model as well, is just keeping up with the different policies and whether or not they're live or proposed or what all that kind of stuff is. Um, but if you've got some ideas about how we could model that or represent that, that'd be great. So. Well, could you not, and this is a question, and picking up on that, could you not if you know what incentives are and then you're using this model can you not adjust doesn't it give you the flexibility to adjust it down or adjust no no but you need to know what the incentives yeah. are for your jurisdiction in that regard that's what you're looking at it in a particular jurisdiction i think from a commonwealth perspective it's really hard for us to be on top of it you know the jurisdiction to have a role in um, different types of incentives that may be unique for their jurisdiction that may not be, you know, you may negotiate or discuss or again, whether it's, um, you know, tax incentive, whether it's, you know, in um, wage incentives or, you know, employees or, or, you know, land removing, you know, rates or something that, that's not something it's the negotiation sometimes they provide that may not be a public thing that you can uh, feed in. So, suppose what what that they're saying here is do you have the flexibility as well here if you know how you can where it's coming in where you could adjust it accordingly because that's what this is it allows you to have higher costs lower costs or identify oh yeah absolutely mm -hmm. i understand that it's yeah. just coming from the industry um that our uh, tax professionals mm -hmm. oh professionals yeah don't speak to yeah. yeah so oh yeah no i i i really understand yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, so I guess to summarise the question, I'm trying to remember, the, the original question was still around these uh, taxes and royalties and whether or not we can include them and all the rest of it. And again, um, uh, from the back end sort of point of view, I think there's definitely some scope that we can sort of do around this space. Our challenge is keeping up with the changes in policy and all that sort of thing. Um, but if, there, if we want to have general... Uh, there might also be some sensitivities about whether or not you can negotiate particular deals or there's something extra you can put on top. Um, but if uh, if there's something that stands out that we can put over the top of it, then um, yeah, definitely if they become solidified in terms of in a similar way that royalties do, um, then definitely we can apply those on a state basis because it's spatial. So we can just put an extra layer on, on top and, and go for that. So. Probably from a confidential 
And that obviously will be a negotiation that we have with uh, Geoscience Australia. <laughs> we put it on that. Yeah. Oh. Uh, do you want to talk about that in the, the portal for the economic fairways or so because to be honest I'm not sure if you're updating the, the exchange rate with the economic fairways much more. Um, for, for I mean for a lot of the assumptions yeah behind the, the hood they are relatively static yeah um, and it, it yeah again it's it's a, a, another thing that we need to work on to make sure that you don't end up with you know decay through entropy mm -hmm. um, you know there's, there's different inputs into the model that we do update time to time depending on the information that's available so for example in the minerals um, version of this uh, a lot of the, the costs are tied to the, the depth of the sedimentary cover that you're going to have to go through in order to access the resources. And that's something that, you know, as a um, federal geological survey, uh, you know, we're actively researching. So as we, as we get better understanding of those depths, then we can update the model. Um, yeah, uh, and a lot of the, a lot of the cost parameters, the sort of sort that you're talking about in terms of commodity prices and things like that. In the steel model, we're calculating a levelized cost of steel, so we're not actually selling the steel at this particular point. But I guess you've got input commodities in the form of iron ore and that kind of thing too. Um, a lot of those are actually set not by hard code, but they're set by the input file itself. And so then if you want to get into that level of detail, you can get into the code. And there are some just through my laziness for the most part, hard-coded parameters in there that we could expose and make them uh, more freely accessible. Again, it's it's a matter of mucking around with the code itself at that stage. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the afternoon session. Um, yeah, uh, this afternoon we um, have two talks, which and then we'll head into a break, and then there's going to be a sort of Q and A session. But we're very delighted to have with us. Um, two speakers uh, that will give us an in industrial industry perspective. Um, so I'd like to first introduce uh, Damien Dwyer, who's going to be, who's from Low Emissions Technology Australia. And he's going to be talking about decarbonizing the mining sector. So thanks, thanks Damien. Great. Well, my thanks to Andrew and um, to Geoscience Australia, particularly um, Christina, for the opportunity to be with you all this afternoon. Um, as I'm sure we all know, the session after lunch is always a, always a fun one, so I'll, I'll do what I can to, um, to keep us going. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging, as other speakers have, uh, the traditional custodians of the land we're meeting on, uh, the Wajak people, and I wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing contribution uh, to the land, to culture, um, and the contribution they make to the life of this city and to the region. So my presentation, uh, take probably a slightly different angle, pull us back a little bit from the excellent um, green steel focused presentations we've had so far and SNAPS in particular, for the live fire demonstration we had um, just before lunch, which I know is always nerve wracking. So it was good to see that go so well. Um, what I'm going to do is, I guess, take a slightly broader perspective, looking at the decarbonisation opportunities and challenges uh, facing the broad mining sector as a whole um, and the minerals industry across Australia uh, and the role that low emission technology in particular um, can play in rising to those challenges and, and grasping those opportunities. I'll also take the chance um, to introduce probably to some of you the first time, um, Low Emission Technology Australia, the organisation I work for um, and the role we're playing in working with the mining sector. So what's that look like? Um, over the next 15 minutes or so. Um, a reminder of the context of the emissions reduction task uh, now facing the mining sector, now facing heavy industry more broadly, um, as it looks to reduce emissions across the Australian economy and make a contribution to the global uh, emissions reduction task we all face. Um, I'll provide a very brief opportunity, uh, very brief overview, sorry, of the opportunities for emissions reduction that exist within uh, the mining industry. 
um, and then uh, finish with a look overview of letter uh, and the role that it's playing. And at the end, to link back to some of the conversations today to take a slightly different, um, but I hope ultimately complementary uh, approach to the conversation we're having so far about what an ongoing role for metallurgical coal uh, might play in that cleaner energy future. This is the one I want to start with, the, um, the context, uh, the emissions reduction task facing the economy um, and particularly safeguard mechanism facilities, which are mining heavy industry facilities. So Australia, as we heard earlier in, in Christine's opening, Christine's opening introductions, we've committed to a 43 emission, 43 percent emissions reduction on 2005 levels by 2030 um, and on the way to net zero by 2050. Um, particular focus, the reform safeguard mechanism, which um, commenced on the 1st of July this year and applies from 2023-24 onwards, um, it sets forward a pretty serious emissions reduction task for uh, heavy industry, um, but there are differential emissions reduction obligations for uh, cement and aluminium compared to mining uh, and particularly for oil and gas. Um, Without going through the details of the safeguard mechanism, you will set a baseline for emissions from particular facilities. You need to keep below that baseline. If you're below that baseline, um, you carry on. If you're above the baseline, you enter into a compliance arrangement whereby you need to reduce your emissions. So for many, many years, those baselines were set at fairly static level. Um, but going forward, you now face an emissions reduction task. So a, a reduction in your baseline each and every year. And for most of the mining industry, um, that's 4.9% per year. And that's consistent with the 43 uh, emissions reduction uh, task at 2030. And there'll be a review uh, in a couple of years time to work out what it's going to be from 2030 onwards down to net zero by 2050. Um, opportunities exist for certain sections of the industry to receive funding. Um, Oil and gas, coal are excluded from those funding opportunities, uh, new facilities, uh, but aluminium, cement, and particularly steel um, have funding opportunities that they can explore through the Power and the Regions Fund and the various funding opportunities that exist there. Um, and a key point to guess to finish on from a, a minerals perspective is that commitment, the net zero by 2050, is consistent with the obligations that the industry has itself um, committed to in recent years. So the mining industry and the oil and gas industry both have net zero by 2050 um, commitments that they've made, um, but this gives legislative and regulatory life to those commitments. So it does mean that now the regulators will be coming to the facilities and expecting those emissions reductions to have taken place. So those changes, if nothing else, but a lot else, but if nothing else, um, give new and increasing impetus to the industry uh, to move forward with those emissions reduction um, opportunities, technologies, in essence, to do whatever they can. And on all of the above theme is something I'll come back to, uh, to look at what their opportunities for emissions reductions might be. Quite a long list there, I won't go through them all, but um, a couple that loom large, electrification. So exploring electrification opportunities um, across the facilities. Uh, vehicles are a good example, a lot of diesel use um, on site. Can that be electrified? What are the opportunities there? What role could hydrogen, we had um, fuel cells mentioned before, is hydrogen a role for heavy transport vehicles that have a single point source where they start, they go out, they do their thing, they come back to that point source? Does that give opportunities to that form of fleet that might not exist in a light vehicle context? Um, similarly with um, rail, so significant amount of rail for haulage for iron ore in the west, a lot of coal in the east, um, what opportunities are there uh, in, in that space? And then some of the others, which is where we play um, a role, carbon capture and storage. What role does it play going forward, both offshore and onshore? And I'll come back to that. Energy efficiency always looms large, uh, particularly if you, when you're an energy intensive industry, energy producers in some cases, um, what role can that play? Um, and then uh, one of the areas that, that we've made investments in uh, ventilated air methane, which is essentially technology to reduce fugitive emissions um, in coal mining facilities, both underground and above ground, but particularly underground. Um, those um, coal mines have limes to run, um, but they now have emissions reduction obligations, which are very, very live. What are they going to do? 
um, and ventilated air methane, and that's a picture of a ventilated air methane facility, um, what can it do? Um, and so that's an area we're uh, exploring as well. So they're really just case studies, examples. Um, the Minerals Council of Australia, uh, not my organisation, but the broad representative body for the mining industry, have a climate action plan that includes that commitment to net zero that I mentioned, and a series of case studies of various of the, the activities that mining companies more broadly are taking uh, to reduce their emissions. And so going forward, um, you know, it won't be a 30, 40 page document, it should be hundreds of pages because there are so many things going on to meet those emissions reduction opportunities. So um, just really quickly on letter who we are. So Low Emission Technology Australia, organisation I joined about six months ago. So I'm still a newbie, which I'll use uh, extensively uh, when any questions come up. Um, had 17 years in the oil and gas industry through APF before that. Um, but really, really happy to join the organisation for pretty much the reasons that are set out on the screen. It's an investor um, in technologies to reduce emissions. Particular focus is mining, uh, coal mining and others, and particular focus on those hard to abate sectors. So the sorts of facilities, cement, steel, aluminium, that are covered by the safeguard facilities, uh, safeguard mechanism, what are they going to do to reduce their emissions? And, and so that's where we play a role. Don't play a lot in the renewable space. Um, it's a pretty busy space, lots of people very focused on that. But what about these other industries that are still here, still with us, and in many cases have a pretty strong future? Um, how can we play a role with them? So that's kind of where we focus our time. And I'll bring that back to, to Steel in a little while. So the next couple of slides are to talk a little bit about Letter, what we do, um, what role we can play. Um, so where do we focus our, our time? Because we're both an investor and an industry association. Most of my career is in an industry association, so that advocacy role is where, where I play. So demonstration of new low emissions technologies, investors in those technologies. Um, a big example for us is carbon capture and storage. We uh, have invested, I'll come back to it in a second, hundreds of millions of dollars into an onshore CCS project in Queensland and um, uh, looking to, one, make good on that investment um, and two, see what that leads to in the future because um, very firmly of the view that if there's another CCS project that wants to get up, we are not competitors um, because if we both get up, um, we're still well short of where we need to be. So if you get up, excellent. If I get up, excellent. If we both get up, even better. Um, deployment of that multi-industry carbon storage technology. So one of the ways we've given life to that is the storage site that we're looking at is going to be a multi-user, has to be a multi-user hub. That was one of the conditions of our investment. So it's not a one company, one project, one sequestration site, it, it is potentially to open up storage opportunities for multi-industries. So if you think on the East Coast where we are, you think Gladstone and you think there's a coal-fired power station, probably not the target, but there's cement, there's aluminium, uh, there's alumina, and there are three, six LNG trains across three projects, all of which are in the top 10 or top 20 of the, uh, emitting facilities and the safeguard mechanism. So significant amounts of CO2 um, that require something to happen with them. And if you're a cement facility, and I was mentioning this in lunchtime, you could move from using coal-fired power stations right now, because that's the cheapest form of electricity you can get, you move 100% to renewables, and which is excellent, that's about 60% of your emissions uh, profile. The other 40 or so comes from the actual chemical processes that produce the cement and they don't have anything at the moment. So what role could CCS, what role could other technologies play in turning 6% emissions reduction through a switch to renewables into 100% emissions reduction, which is what ultimately those facilities need going forward. So that's an example of the sort of work that we do. And the other, the other one, just to finish on this slide, the role that I play is in the advocacy space. So talking through the role that low emission technologies can play, doing a little bit of the don't forget about um, those facilities that are that are here and those facilities that now have an emissions reduction obligation, um, which is quite helpful. Those of you from Canberra, I'm a Canberra Raiders fan, so I'm used to cheering for the underdog and used to 
then subsequently being disappointed um, by the results. Um, yeah. and, and part of how that plays out is things like we heard Chris from the Q speak earlier about the National Hydrogen Strategy. Part of the role that we play and we advocate is an all of the above approach to hydrogen development. So if you can make a green hydrogen project work, that is fantastic. Um, but you shouldn't rule out uh, other production pathways to low emissions, low carbon hydrogen, um, because um, this task is challenging, really challenging to get to net zero by 2050, to hit our emissions reduction targets by 2030, really challenging task before us. So um, if it's already tough, don't make it tougher by ruling out particular options and opportunities. And that's a, a message that we've tried to send in. So. Chris mentioned, I think, in his presentation, the sharp divide between uh, those, and I'm, this is the only time I'm going to use colour, um, those advocating for green versus blue. We don't fit in that camp. We fit in the all of the above, green and blue are fine. Um, so that's part of the approach that we've tried to advocate through the, that process, and we'll continue to advocate on all of these processes going forward. So very quickly then, this is the rubber hits the road part of the presentation, um, serious dollars. So we have funding of around $700 million um, to operate the investments that we operate. Um, established in 2006, we've invested, the numbers are there, 343 so far, a lot of that in the CCS space. Um, I'm really, really looking forward to see that turn into boots on the ground, um, so to speak, in the very near future. And the one I wanted to focus on is the one in the top right-hand corner, this right-hand corner from where I'm standing, uh, the 260 for you project. So that's money that we've got allocated to us that I can give you the tip. We're under pretty significant pressure from the board to turn into genuine projects. And I'll come back to that in a sense. But this gives you a sense of the scale and scope of the work that we're doing. So a little bit on what we've achieved. Um, it's always helpful when you're talking to the board about this one. Um, We've gone through and been involved here in WA um, in the past. Uh, the SRAP race in, in Queensland, which is where our focus is right now, uh, proving up storage locations, working very heavily with the CO2CRC through the Otway uh, Demonstration Centre. We've been involved with them for a very long time, the work they're doing down there, um, and then looking at some other opportunities. Uh, fugitive emissions I mentioned before, uh, alum cycle, for those of you familiar with it, um, power generation uh, technology, and, and there are a range of other things uh, that we've worked on and will continue to work on over the last, um, well, 17 years since they started. So um, uh, that's kind of to give you a sense of it. Now, to, to close, um, I'm very happy to take any questions. A really busy slide, which I can't even read myself from here, so I won't expect you to do so. But it's really, this is about the, the project pipeline. Um, the sorts of areas in which we are working and investing and a bit of a time frame out to 2040. Uh, and there's a key box that uh, is in there that I won't point out, which is um, our funding uh, agreements are reassessed in 2027. Um, so if we hold another event in 2028 and I'm not here, uh, you'll know which way that funding uh, cycle pathway went. But We'll go through that. But going forward, there are a range of investments that we're considering, we're looking to make, and we've had a business development manager join us just recently for specifically that purpose. Go out, find the best, most useful things to do um, with that money, um, and let's make a real difference to the emissions reduction task facing those industries. So really quickly then, a um, little green arrow is uh, metallurgical coal and its role in clean steel development. Um, so we like to use clean low emissions hydrogen compared to green or blue hydrogen. Um, we also like to use sort of clean steel compared maybe to green steel. And I know that's been the focus of the day. And that's not to say one's right or wrong. It's just to say there are multiple pathways to what low emission steel might look like. So with that in mind, the metallurgical coal clean steel story, there are projects, um, clean steel projects around the world utilisation of hydrogen to replace met coal. That's been a common theme, some of the work, and that's where a lot of the conversation today um, was focused. There aren't local projects focused on the idea of how do we reduce emissions from 
metallurgical coal and traditional steel making processes. What role can emissions capture play? What role can CCS play in that existing technology development pathway? And notable in that space is Bluescope, um, which I think many will be aware, it's a public announcement, have invested serious dollars now in uh, relining, re uh, upgrading their existing steel pathway. So they've made a serious investment in, I wouldn't call it business as usual, but they've certainly made a significant investment in existing technology at, at Port Kembla. So um, the role for someone like Letter, the role for us all, I think, is then to talk to them about, given you've made that investment decision, what's your line of sight to serious emissions reduction? What role can CCS, what role can um, traditional power generation technologies, what role can emissions reduction technologies play in that, given you've made that choice? So, so that's a conversation that we've started and we'll continue to have, and we'll see where it leads with, with Blue Scope and what their plans are. So, and part of that too is there are multiple pathways to hydrogen production, uh, the green hydrogen production that we've spoken about, but then what low emissions, SMR, coal gasification, those sorts of um, those sorts of pathways, what role can they play going forward? And is there a link in to that clean steel development pathway that we're talking about? Notable, of course, we've got two steel um, facilities in Australia. Both of them are sub world scale, like our petroleum refineries. Um, we've only got two, they're sub world scale. Um, unlike petroleum refinery, where there is no prospect of new investment um, to steel, is there? And I think that's the exciting part of the, the work that we're doing. And it's also one of the very, very key reasons for being involved today um, is the opportunities that we might have in this space. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop. Um, thank you all um, for your attention very, very much. Thank GA for the opportunity to be involved and happy to take any questions you might have. So thank you again. Well, thank you very much indeed for that talk. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah. So a fundamental one. I mean, this chicken and egg, which has to come first? Um, a legislated recognition of carbon capture that generates Australian carbon credit units mm -hmm. or the research that shows it's physically possible and then that generates a mental survey act? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I guess on the, the second one first, there are nearly 40 projects around the world operating, storing a bit over 100 million tonnes a year of emissions. So the technology um, is proved and in operation. It's about scaling up and making that work. So then it becomes about the price, comes about the economics, and becomes about how I work through that. So the project we're working on, the CTSCO, excuse me, <coughs> project in Queensland, um, the project developers will tell you two things. They'll, they'll tell you uh, all of the geological engineering, all those issues uh, do not keep them up at night at all. Uh, project approval timeframes, getting through the, the Queensland government they're dealing with, and that's not to sledge the Queensland government, that's just to say getting through project approval timelines, that's what's keeping them up at night. And so the challenge for us all is 43 by 2030 um, and emissions reduction commitments across all of the sort of facilities we're talking about, all very important. You know, and so it's self-evident the need to reduce emissions. There's no question there. The question becomes if I'm investing in a reasonably capital intensive emissions reduction technology to reduce emissions at those facilities, can I navigate the project approval timeline such that it's up and running in 2030? So for something like CCS, 2030 looks really challenging. But for 2050, there's a serious contribution that can make. Um, it's what happens between now and then. I think if I'm a operating a cement facility, that's keeping me up at night. It reminds me of some years ago, now I can't remember, maybe 10 years ago, I think Treasury put, put out a thing talking about the future of CCS. And they said, about 2035. Yeah. <laughs> and that yeah. was a really long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so just really quickly on, on the second point. Um, there is an ACU. You can earn ACUs for the one CCS project that got through um, before the ability for safeguard mechanism facilities to earn ACUs was killed by the safeguard crediting 
mechanism legislation. So now if you reduce emissions through, say, a CCS project or any emissions reduction project, you can do two things. You can meet your compliance obligations, keep your emissions below your baseline, or if you do better than your baseline, you earn credits that you can sell. You can only sell them to other safeguard mechanism facilities. You can't sell them as ACUs more openly, but you can earn serious value through a CCS project that way. And so that does matter. And that will, if you if you face really serious emissions reduction obligations and you've got clean energy regulator knocking on your door to say where your emissions reductions, then you know, you're open to possibilities that might not have made sense in a pre uh, you know safeguard reform world because you just didn't have to. Now you do. So things that made sense in a technical geological sense, but probably the economics didn't stack up, that number's been or that that all that equation has been altered. There's a whole there's a new variable in that equation which can change the outcome. Okay, I'd like to invite up our next speaker. So our next speaker is uh, Jenny Selway from Hilt CRC. Um, I've been keeping my eye on Hilt, but I haven't <laughs> since you've been doing some great stuff there. So uh, yeah, really looking forward to hearing your talk. All right, thanks everyone for listening to me today and thanks to Geoscience Australia for the invitation to speak. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Wujuk people, um, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so my name's Jenny Selway. I'm the CEO of HILT CRC. Um, and HILT is a bit of a, uh, bit of a mouthful. It stands for Heavy Industry Low Carbon Transition um, and CRC stands for Cooperative Research Centre. Um, so we're a $200 million 10-year uh, funded cooperative research centre. And for those who aren't familiar with, uh, with CRCs as an entity, uh, we've, CRCs bring together Commonwealth funding, uh, industry partners and tertiary research institutions all together to create a, an ecosystem really where um, R&D that's industry-led and really creating value for industry um, are all working together. So HILT is sort of the umbrella that facilitates that, that coordination and that collaboration. Um, and we're focused on um, a prosperous decarbonised heavy industry sector, specifically focused on iron ore, steel, alumina and cement. Uh, so why those industries? Well, there's the obvious environmental imperative as we approach uh, climate change tipping points. These industries make up 20% of emissions globally and about 14% of our emissions domestically. Um, but it's also an economic imperative. So mining and um, construction combined make up more than 20% of Australia's GDP. Uh, we're the largest exporter of iron ore. We expect to export it 880 um, million tonnes last year and the resource sector uh, combined contributes up to 68% of our export earnings. So, uh, you know, hugely significant sector um, and as the world and the globe moves to decarbonise, we need to make sure that Australia can remain competitive in this space. Uh, so at HILT's mission in this role is to de-risk the technology pathways uh, that's required so that heavy industry can remain competitive. Um, and so we do that by linking the industry partners and the research partners uh, that I mentioned earlier uh, to decarbonise these sectors. So I'm the CEO, as I mentioned, my background's actually mainly in oil and gas. I've got um, over 20 years experience in, in energy. I was at, at ExxonMobil for 18 years uh, with a specialization in joint venture management. So quite similar skill sets to managing a CRC. Um, and then also spent a year at AMO in the um, connections space. Uh, so now I've been in this role for three months now. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here working to decarbonize these hard to abate sectors. So at Hilt, we've got over 50 partners um, and some of them are here in the room today and others are dialed in as well. So it's really great to see such a large Hilt representation here. Um, we've got nine research partners. Um, so University of Adelaide, ANU, CSIRO and Curtin University are all our core research partners. Um, and then for Key, we've got Swinburne, University of Newcastle and also QUT. We've also got a few uh, international associations in the research space as well, which is really exciting and we're hoping to develop more, uh, more research collaborations internationally too. Uh, and then we've got over 36 industry partners um, and you can see our core partners shown there, um, which has a heavy uh, focus from WA, but an equally heavy, heavy focus across the whole of the nation. So um, Adbri, Alcoa, Fortescue, Grange Resources, Liberty, Roy Hill and South32 are our 
core partners. Uh, core partners tend to be the producers. Um, and then our other industry partners at varying levels of membership are the technology providers uh, and OEMs. We've also got strong relationships with government. Uh, so obviously the Commonwealth is uh, funding half of the CRC, uh, but we've also got really strong relationships with state governments. So South Australia and Western Australia and, um, and the Mirror, uh, where I was presenting at their conference this morning, are key partners. And we've also got Queensland as affiliate partner as well. And so those partners are spread out nationally. Um, so it's a really, uh, really great way to bring everyone together um, across the whole nation. And then increasingly, we've got these um, links internationally as well. So HILT actually facilitates Australia's co-leadership of the net zero industry mission, uh, which is um, one of the missions under Mission Innovation, which is a um, vehicle of action through UN and COP. Uh, so industry and energy has got a high focus at this year's COP28 um, and Australia is co-leading that for, net zero in, for the net zero industry mission. So what we are aiming to do is really provide that ecosystem for collaboration, for decarbonisation of those sectors um, and through those international links help get innovation um, knowledge from Australia spread out uh, across the globe and also make sure innovation from across the globe is fed back to Australia as well. Uh, so which are the major challenges facing the three, um, the three sectors that we're trying to de-risk? And to put this in context, and, and Damien just went over some of this as well, you know, the IEA estimates that um, we'll need 90% reduction in the carbon intensity of steel making processes by 2050 to meet Paris um, Agreement targets. Uh, Damien talked about the hard to abate sectors of cement with the, um, with the high emissions um, proportion that comes from the conversion of limestone itself. Um, and alumina refining produces 43% of Australia's industrial carbon emissions uh, because it's such an energy intensive process. So that's why these sectors are termed hard to abate sectors and why it's a hugely important um, problem to, to solve. Um, so for iron and steel in particular, we're looking at how to make sure our lower grade Australian ores are suitable for uh, green steel and green iron ore uh, processes. Uh, so we've got multiple projects looking at each stage of the green steel making process, whether it's uh, green iron ore or green steel, um, to try and de-risk it for lower grade ores. For cement and lime, we are looking into the conversion of limestone, um, so and be, that being particularly hard to, to hard to abate. So many of our projects focus on cross-cutting technologies such as carbon capture and storage, as well as low carbon fuels that, that Damien talked about in his talk. And then for alumina, it's the scale of electrification and the suitability of variable energy sources, um, variable renewable energy sources for steady state industrial processes. That's key, as well as looking at storage that goes apart uh, along with that um, and using alternative energy sources in steam digestion and calcinators. So I just touched on some of the sort of specific challenges for each industry. Um, and that's led to the design of HILT's research programs. So we are industry led uh, in everything that we do and that's really built into our governance processes to approve each project. We've also got three separate research programs. So the um, program one, which is the orange on the top left, is looking at specific process technologies in any of those areas. So really specific, well-defined technical challenges that we're trying to solve. The cross-cutting program in blue is looks at areas of commonality between the three industries. Um, so this is things like hydrogen, CCUS, um, other alternative fuels that are common uh, to all three industries. And then at the bottom, um, even though it's the bottom of this uh, pie chart, the facilitating transformation program, I like to think of it more as umbrella factors. Uh, these are the things that need to be in place in order to make change you know, anywhere really. So things like social license, policy frameworks, um, supply chains, workforce, um, road mapping, uh, those kind of issues all fall into program three. We're trying to work on all of these simultaneously so that we're covering all of the, or all of the areas that need to be focused on to decarbonise. And so we try to pull that all together through this chart. So going across from left to right, you can see our three sectors that we focus on, uh, the raw products on the left, iron ore, bauxite, limestone and additives, moving to the decarbonised product on the right, so decarbonised steel, alumina or cement. 
And within each process path, we're going from left to right. Um, we've got various projects looking at those technical challenges that falls under program one. Uh, that's true for all three sectors. But then you can see all of the cross linkages between the sectors um, that exist. So whether or not that's commonality through the use of green fuels or how you're going to um, decarbonize high temperature processing, um, or whether it's use of byproducts from bauxite or iron ore mining that could potentially be used as a supplementary um, cement material in the limestone um, in the cement making process, or whether it's the use of net zero lime from the limestone um, process that could be used as an input for uh, bauxite or iron ore processing. There's just many linkages between all of these three industries. Um, and this was the circular philosophy that was um, in mind when the three industries were selected as part of the bid for the CRC. So all of those linkages fall into um, the cross-cutting technologies program. Um, and then we've got the facilitating transformation up the top sitting like an umbrella uh, which is which all needs to be in place in order to make those changes. And so these are um, some of the quick start projects that were put into place pretty much as soon as HILT started up. Um, so I should have mentioned we're a 10 year funded CRC. We were funded at the very end of 2021. Um, and our first board meeting was February of 2022. So we're just past 18 months in. And the previous CEO, not, I can't take credit for this, uh, did a very good job of getting these quick start projects up and running um, as soon as HILT was started. The very first board meeting, eight of these projects were approved. So what that means is that we've got a lot of results that are starting to come in now, which is really exciting. Um, and it, we're also in this phase of then trying to determine where the research focus needs to be for the next uh, three or four years um, to take us out to the end of 2026. So the blue boxes are the projects that fall um, under program one, so specific industry technologies. The yellow boxes are our cross-cutting projects um, and the orange boxes are the uh, facilitating transformation projects. Um, and in a little while, I'll take you through some, of, some key results from each of those. Um, and we're in this process now of, of trying to map those out um, where they sit on that circularity diagram that I showed before. Um, and then pulling it all together in what we term a patchwork quilt, because quite a lot of the results um, relate to each other and um, feed into each other, and then determine where we should make our research um, a priority going forward. So these projects show some of the current um, one year and 18 year, 18 month projects uh, that we've got approved. Um, and we've also got two three year projects that are approved that we're working on now, uh, one looking at the prevention of sticking in H2 fluidized beds and one looking at hydrogen uh, combustion for iron and cement sectors, um, which are longer three-year projects that will take us out to the end of 2026. So I'll just touch on some of these um, results in a really, really high, uh, high level, um, recognising that I'm not a green steel or a green iron ore expert, but we do have people from Hield who in the room who um, have much higher expertise than me in these areas. So we have a lot of projects looking at how hydrogen can best be used in direct reduced iron processes, um, whether that be in shaft furnaces, fluidized bed reactions or flash reduction, um, and how we can increase the viability of hydrogen use, particularly for lower grade Australian ores. Um, and also what pretreatment technologies might be useful um, for green or iron for green iron ore processes for Australian ores. So this is an example of some of the results that are coming through um, with, in historically with using lower grade um, ores in fluidized beds um, has created problems with stickiness between the iron ore fines. Um, so we did a quick start that looked at um, various ways to prevent that. It also looked at um, the issue of breaking of pellets in shaft furnaces as well. Um, and from that, we're doing a three year project now that's looking at um, different coatings such as um, magnesium oxide and other um, ways to control temperature, uh, specifically to try and stop this, pro this problem of sticking in fluidized beds um, so that that becomes a potential pathway for, um, for H2 uh, DRI production. Uh, we've also got a few different projects, projects on beneficiation. So this one, the ores were thermally pre-treated using a porous burner 
Um, and it was found that the softening effect um, of the gang on their pretreatment provided a 20 to 30% reduction in the subsequent grinding energy uh, required for beneficiation um, with enhanced magnetism and in, uh, increased FE content. So this is just starting to flesh out, um, you know, how far down that value chain does it make sense to go in Australia? And there might be different options for different producers. Uh, but this is potentially a technology where you can just go down the value chain a little bit by some, some treatment of the iron ore that can help increase its applicability to green steel processes um, that can be then exported. We've got other projects looking at um, different ways of beneficiation using um, brines from desalinisation as well. Um, and then this project, which is the results have just come through for this one, so it's sort of hot off the press, um, looked at various different ways of making green steel. Um, and so the diagram on the left shows different options, whether you do a um, shaft furnace DRI or a fluidized bed DRI, um, electric arc furnace versus a smelter and slag removal with the basic oxygen furnace and sort of compared those different um, options. Um, it also looked at um, beneficiation sort of upstream versus slag removal later in the process. So using a component level model um, that in contained high level performance and cost data, they did an end to end assessment of iron ore behaviour for lower quality ores against those different pathway options. Um, and it actually showed the graph on the right hand side shows um, the levelised cost of liquid steel in Australia's um, Australian dollars per tonne for a range of different ore types, um, comparing the smelter BOF pathway, which is in green, uh, versus the EAF pathway in red. Um, so it actually indicates that potentially um, that smelter BOF pathway could is, is competitive for, um, for lower grade ores, but it does depend on uh, the beneficiation pathway um, that you use upstream. So it's kind of a customised beneficiation for both. Um, so this is quite, um, promising results, but it does require further de-risking of fluidized bed, smelter and beneficiation technologies, um, as well as testing of the, the models itself. Um, so we've just got these results in, which look quite interesting, and we're in the phase of um, scrapping out some, some further three-year projects that will follow on from this. Uh, so there are our main focus areas in iron ore and steel, and I know that's obviously the focus of today. Um, just quickly, I'll talk about some of the work we're doing in Illumina. Um, so here looking at variable renewable energy um, and the use of different storage technologies that can be used um, in, the, in the Bayer process for electrified steam generation. Uh, and also different ways that um, we can do the calcining process in steam to enable the steam to be recovered and then fed back into the digestion process, process which could potentially um, uh, reuse 30 to 40% of that steam. So both of those projects combined uh, leading towards a uh, decarbonised um, alumina process. Uh, and then for cement and lime, um, like we just talked about in the previous talk, um, looking at CCUS options, um, so various roadmaps and multi-criteria assessment projects, um, and did indicate that um, potentially mineral carbonation may be promising as a CCUS pathway. Um, and then finally, we've got a, num a large number of projects in the hydrogen um, looking at both things like hydrogen hubs and how to make sure that you've got uh, successful hydrogen hubs. It's not just a co-location of people, they're actually working together synergistically. Um, looking at hydrogen um, storage and hydrogen costs in particular locations um, and whether that hydrogen, the cost differential for supplying hydrogen is steady state versus intermittent supply. Down to some really technical projects looking at materials compatibility of hydrogen in certain plants and the impacts of process chemistry. So uh, this is sort of four or five projects linked together. Um, and that um, photo there is the kickoff for a new hydrogen project um, from a few weeks ago with our team um, from CSIRO and University of Adelaide at, um, at Grange Resources plant um, in Port Ladder in, in Burnie, near Burnie in Tasmania uh, for that project kickoff. So that kind of gives you a summary of the projects and some of those quick start results that are coming in. And I think hopefully, as I've talked through, you'll be able to see how different projects relate to each other and how some of those results fit together. Um, and so what we do is those results come in, we go back to this circular economy diagram and we've got other roadmaps that are more specific to each sector and 
try and pl plot out these results as a, where they sit on this patchwork quilt to then decide where to go forward um, for our three and four year projects. So it's a pretty exciting time at the Hilt at the moment as we, as we go through that. Um, and then of course, we've got these um, circular, um, the facilitating transformation um, factors up the top, which, um, which are really, really important and a huge um, focus for Hilt. And we've just conducted a series of round tables to um, establish where to focus on in this particular program. Uh, so we did one in Adelaide about a month ago and one in Perth last week. Um, we've got one in Canberra coming up at the end of September as well. We also have an education program, which is pretty typical for CRC. So we've got nine PhD students at the moment um, with a further four approved um, and also working on some course development. But importantly, we do also have a heavy industry of the workforce um, focus, which, which we'll pivot into towards the last half of the, of the CRC's life. So that's pretty much all I had. I would just give a cheeky plug for our conference, which is coming up in Perth um, in the 17th to 19th of October. Um, and Tuesday the 17th in particular is open to the public. So um, if you're interested in HILT, then feel free to come along. Um, and we'd be really pleased to see everyone there. Um, and that's all I had. Um, so thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions? Chong. Yeah, so the projects that we have um, completed at the moment, looking at things like variable sources of renewables and, and things like that, um, don't really um, delve into where the source of that electricity is coming from which we realise is quite a limitation for these quick start projects. So whether it's a connection to the grid or typically it's not connection to the grid, right? They're looking at how to um, how to decarbonise or electrify themselves. So they're going to, you know, very high levels of penetration of renewables. Um, where one limitation of those studies is, you know, where is this um, green electricity coming from? And with a recognition that sort of decarbonised um, electricity infrastructure is a huge problem for everyone that needs to be tackled. So um, we don't have any specific um, projects that look at electrification because it's sort of getting a little bit outside our boundary area um, from process related technologies. Um, but it's such an important boundary consideration um, that we do have a lot of work going on as we map out these future projects um, to sort of establish where we should sit as far of that boundary and, and also what role he can play in pulling together a picture of, um, of electrification requirements for heavy industry to help inform policy, um, you know, as we speak to governments and things like that.